Hello everyone and welcome to the Shiart Podcast. I'm your host Ross Baxter and today is episode episode 101 <laughs> of the series. <laughs> uh, the podcast is a weekly series where I bring on guests from the film and game industries to talk about their journey, thoughts and education. You name it folks, we cover it here in the podcast. By gosh, same 101 is a mouthful there Robert, I was struggling. <laughs> Like, it's a weird one. Oh, uh, it's I'm I'm not sure. Like for the future episodes from here on out, am I going to just continue seeing the saying the numbers? It was a lot easier when it was not <laughs> when it was less just, than three. <laughs> you can just go back to just you know one to one hundred. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll restart. It's called season two or something like that. Yeah. Season two. That's what we're going to go with. So welcome, folks, uh, to season two of the Shoot Art Podcast. We're <laughs> rocking with it. We've got a legend on the show. I can't wait to talk uh, talk to Robert uh, McCall. Uh, on his um, on his journey, about his journey, you name it, folks. Um, we're going to be diving into the world of environment art. If this is your first time here, thank you for listening. And uh, most importantly, don't forget to subscribe, smash the like button um, if you're new. And uh, with that said, let's get right into today's show. So, um, as always, we're going to be talking about his his journey and the chaos of his his year so far. He's done so many amazing things. Recently winning the Rookies Award for Game Development. So thank you, Robert, for coming on the show. It's a pleasure having you. How are you doing? I'm good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really good. Yeah, and thanks. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, also, thanks so much for having me on. It's well, a pleasure. I can't wait, man. Uh, we were just talking for like 20 minutes before before we even started this. There's, there's so <laughs> much topics and so many new things that just came to the table I had no idea about. And it's made it so much more, uh, more, more madness, more awesome to talk about. So... Um, as always, though, we'll start off with good old introductions, mate. Tell us a wee bit about yourself, and we'll take it from there. Sure, yeah. So my name is Robert McCall. Uh, I grew up here in Vancouver, Canada. Mm -hmm. Currently working at a studio called Hellbent Games, Incorporated. Um, and yeah, I studied at Think Tank. And yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Perfect. That's what that's yeah. what we need to know. So today's main topic, we're going to be talking about the ins and outs of kind of that transition of becoming an environment artist, but most importantly, obviously hearing his process behind his um, successful piece and submission for the rookies. And it's been uh, shared around on many articles as well. He's also done uh, recently some live streams with the rookies, which is great to see. So we're gonna be talking about his IRO piece, his incredible environment art piece. But before we get into the madness later on, what we're gonna talk about first is like, what? where did this all begin? Like, where did this journey of pursuing art <laughs> the big um, question straight away <laughs> yeah i mean i guess um i guess it depends on how far back you want to go this way is back maybe to a the little beginning. bit <laughs> way back to the beginning this is a uh, this is pretty far back but uh, i think i was eight or something i was in grade three okay i was just nice. thinking about this recently and um i don't know, I, I just i went through a phase where i just like loved drawing dragons oh. i just like, i would draw nothing else you know and i would just draw like you know hundreds of them mm -hmm. And I think there was there was some art assignment with school, you know, or maybe we had to write a short story. And yeah, it was actually pretty cool. I ended up basically doing like Jurassic Park, but with dragons. Uh, this <laughs> which, is, which this podcast was... has just got amazing. You've mentioned two of, my, like, of like some of my favorite things of all time: dragons and dinosaurs. Let's go. Yeah, so I basically just swapped out the dinosaurs, and um, I don't know. I remember I sort of you know showed it to the class, and everybody really loved it. And that was maybe one of my first experiences where I was like, you know really kind of saw how people being receptive to your art and your work, you know, that kind of instilled something in me, I think. And I was like, oh, wow, you know, maybe I could actually do this. And then jumping forward, you know, throughout high school and stuff like that, it kind of, it started to seem less realistic, but I would still, I mean, high school was, I was like one of those kids who would sit in the back of the class mm -hmm. and just like, doodle on my homework <laughs> here that's, that's i was a, the, I was a terrible days. student a lot of <laughs> teachers were like just completely fed up with me um because they would get all of my homework back you know and half of it would be unanswered and most of it would just be drawn on here you provided <laughs> a story okay you provided a creative touch <laughs> yeah yeah um so yeah but around that time too it just you know, I had some family friends who'd been trying to make it in art. Um, I was also playing quite a lot of guitar and, you know, I loved and I, I still love, you know, playing music. But it, I, I don't know, I started to look at it and, you know, I have all these I had all these bands that I loved. Mm -hmm. And but I would look at their um, their band camp or their songs in YouTube, you know, and they'd have like, you know, 3000 to maybe 25,000 views, you know, and it kind of started to freak me out a bit because I was like, 
I mean, to me at least, you know, subjectively, I was like, these bands are amazing. They should be the next Beatles, <laughs> you yeah. know, or they should they, yeah. they have a whole lot of talent. But just, I guess, in the fine art and music world and creative world, it's almost a bit like winning. It's like winning the lottery, but you need to do a hell of a lot more work to even get a lottery ticket. <laughs> yeah, <interesting. laughs> if you get that analogy, you know, know you can't you just mean. go into a store and buy a lottery ticket. You need to work for thousands of hours and practice. And then you get your lottery ticket and then you might somehow be able to actually make a career out of it, mm -hmm. you know, but at the same time, if it doesn't work out, you might be working a dead end job, just trying to pay the bill so you can keep on, um, you know, trying to make it or trying to make a, you know, a, a career or a life out of it. And I started to find that idea really, you know, pretty stressful. So around that time, I started thinking about other things I like to do. And I was thinking about nursing, and I was thinking about counseling, I was thinking about teaching, you know, a whole bunch of things as probably most people do when they're sort of in high school and in their teens, you know, I was sort of trying to explore yeah. and see what I would really, what would really be a good fit for me. And I was also thinking art therapy, because I was like, Oh, well, I really like the idea of, of therapy and counseling and helping people. Right. Uh, and then I was like, oh, but if I could mix that with with doing art or teaching people how to create art so that they can deal with their own emotional issues and demons and stuff. I was like, well, that's that's awesome. Yeah. And that led me to talking to a family friend who was an art therapist. And, you know, she looked at some of my artwork and stuff like that. And I was sort of asking her questions about art therapy. And she kind of gave me uh, a little bit of a... Uh, it's a word for it. A little bit of a reality kick or something like that okay, saying, yeah. you know, she she had been doing art therapy for not sure how long, but, you know, a long time, I think throughout most of her career, uh, probably 20 years, maybe 25 years or something. And so well, she, experienced. She, well experienced, but she was saying, you know, it's it's hard because just there aren't enough people looking for art therapists. It's mm -hmm. one of these things where there are more art therapists out there than people who are really like, I need an art therapist. Which is too bad. I feel like that would be a cool trend to, to catch on art therapy. Of but course. anyways, um, so she was actually studying at Think Tank at the time that I asked her. Oh, nice. She's like, oh, I'm, I'm going through this big career change myself. I'm studying to be a matte painter. Uh, and then she suggested, you know, that I come in for a tour around the school. Um, so I remember I did that maybe a, a couple of weeks or a month later, and I was just sort of blown away by it. Um, you know, I was walking around the rooms and seeing what people were working on. It was actually really cool because when I was at Think Tank, I mentored uh, mentored under a guy named Steph Steph Velzebor. Right. I'm probably butchering his last name, so, so I'm oh, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, not, Steph. Yeah, but... <laughs> I'm not the best at names, man. So I, I'm still uh -huh. learning. I've done like yeah, so yeah. much stuff. And I always, I always, uh, I normally just say the first name. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's probably easier. Uh, and I'm sure you've, I, I'm sure that you've seen his scene. It's this sort of paradise island scene. I think that's what it's called in Art Station. But it yeah. is amazing. And he was my mentor. And he was, you know, pivotal behind Ira's bookstore, you know, with his sort of support and his guidance and everything. But it's really cool because my first tour into Think Tank, I saw him just about finishing off his demo reel. Which I just thought is a kind of cool reincorporation that, you know, I went in for my first tour, saw him finishing off his demo reel. And then, you know, a couple of years later, he's mentoring me. He's and, mentoring you. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so I, I went in uh, on a tour. This is getting a bit long winded, but I went in Here, for a tour. It's great. And... I'm, I'm enjoying it. <laughs> great. Okay. Nice. Um, and yeah, I think even after that point, I still wasn't sure. Um just because, you know, I talked to Scott, one of the owners of Think Tank, and he told me, you know, it's a, it's a hell of a lot of hard work. You know, you need to be here every day. You need to be working, you know, incredibly hard. And I thought, you know, I, I can do that. But some part of me was still like, do I actually have any sort of um, underlying talent or would this would this still work? So I was still kind of unsure, but I took a little while waiting on it. Um, and I think... I, it was a while. I think about a year after that point, I sort of started getting really into doing more digital painting. Uh, so I was just sort of, sort of doing thumbnails and, and um, you know, speed, uh, speed paintings and stuff like that just to practice my skills. Because mm -hmm. my original idea, oh, I didn't even mention this, but a big inspiration too for me throughout high school was just like concept art. I would spend, you know, so much of my free time just on Pinterest, mm -hmm. you know, just looking just at different pieces. For days. And, <laughs> 
yeah, and adding different artists to my list. I think that was about when I discovered um, one of my favorite artists. Ooh, who is and, it? And oh man, I'm I feel terrible. I think it's the pressure. I'm totally drawing a blank on his name. It's but, okay. Oh, uh, Simon Simon Stallenheg. Oh right, okay. I, which I, I'm I, sure most of the people watching the podcast, I hope they're familiar with him because his work is, it's amazing. <laughs> so I remember looking at his paintings and. I just a whole bunch of different concept art. So that was a really big inspiration for me too. So um, my kind of plan with Think Tank was um, maybe I'll first start kind of getting into matte painting. That'll give me a good foundation of, you know, of 2D, you know, um, art techniques. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I can sort of work my way into doing more concept art stuff. But uh, when I was at Think Tank, I just started really getting into 3D. <laughs> I find 3D is... It's a lot of fun. I mean, I, I still I still do a little bit of painting and drawing and stuff, and I, I really want to get better with that stuff. Of course. But it's almost like spending your whole day in... Maybe I'm just a little bit kind of um, ADD or something, but if I spend the whole day in the same program, I find I get a little bit loopy. So that's right. one thing I love about environment art is you're always jumping around. So you're in Maya, and then you throw it into ZBrush and do a little sculpt pass on it, and then you you know, bring that into Marmoset or whatever your baking software is, you know, get a get a really nice bake, which is like the best, most satisfying feeling, uh, you know, and then texture it. And so I really loved that workflow where you're always kind of doing something Constantly on new, like even in the same day, you're always mixing up different softwares and stuff. Yeah. Wow. What, 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 what a start. <laughs> yeah. We're just warming that up. went in all sort of weird directions. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, I was like, cause I was just listening, like listening um, to everything that you were saying in so much depth. Like, there's so many, lots of little bits of advice that we could take from this and uh, really help so many people. So obviously, the main thing uh, that you said right at the start was kind of making that transition into kind of finding the career for you. And it's how can I say it? it's not always the easiest easiest question to answer I was talking about this mm -hmm. on one of the previous um, podcasts and I talked to it very uh, this was like one of the main topics early on which is the the topic of identity and figuring out what you want to do as a career and it's it's not the easiest at times but sometimes it's just all about just you just have to keep trying things out figure things out as you go along and realize it's a process it's it's going to take time and like you said commitment it takes a lot of hours to get good at art it, it takes a lot of hours to get good at anything and if mm -hmm. you're if you're, if you're struggling at trying to find the path that you're trying to get into like that's what uh, one of our main topics will be today is getting that first job in the industry because it's not the easiest but you can make it easy it can you can make this process so much more smoother by just keeping a lot of things simple but before we tie and dive into a variety of different things i just want to say about um, what was it like telling your family that you were wanting to make a career change or wanting to dive into 3D? Like, because I know obviously you were saying to me p beforehand, so you're working at Starbucks, and I mm. want to highlight the the importance of working a nine to five job. I think it's super important. But what was it like uh, making that transition and finally finding your path? You know, for me, at least as far as my family's, uh, you know, my relationship with my family and my parents and stuff, I am. I'm incredibly blessed because yeah. I told my parents that and they were completely, completely supportive and totally on board. Um, I think my, my mom kind of wanted, my mom always wanted me to go into sort of fine art. Um, so I was, I remember talking with her about it and, mm -hmm. you know, she's, she's definitely, she's not the kind of person who would really try and pressure me, but she was sort of saying, you know, oh, well, maybe you should just go to a, go to a fine art school. You know, a big fine art school in Vancouver is, um, it's called Emily Carr. Okay. And she, I think she just always really liked that school. But she said, oh, maybe you should just go to Emily Carr. And so we we had a bit of a conversation with that. My main thing was, and I'm still, I mean, we'll see where, you know, I'm still pretty young. So we'll see kind of where my career takes me. But And I would still love to keep on working on, on more traditional art skills and that kind of stuff. But my big worry was just the amount of of people who will go through, you know, I was working at, I think I was working at Starbucks at the time. So people who will, you know, start their school working at Starbucks, mm -hmm. they'll get a degree in fine art. And then it's kind of a sad reality, but oftentimes people just end up right back at Starbucks. <laughs> just back to where they started. <laughs> yeah, just because it's, it's a, to me, at least from my experience, uh, or from what I've, from what I've sort of observed, it's, 
again, it's sort of that that um, that lottery ticket analogy where it's it's hard to make a break. So I think I tr sort of I remember I talked with my mom about that and I kind of explained my reasoning where I really wanted to be in an artistic field, mm -hmm. but also a field that was consistent and solid. And I knew that if I had the skills and I knew that I was employable, it wouldn't there wouldn't be that random aspect or that unknown aspect. You know, I really like the idea where it's if you know what you're doing and you're and you're a talented artist, yep. there's there's a job out there for you. Of course. And you're still working in a creative field. And then on top of that, you still have personal projects and side hobbies and other things that you can uh, really kind of almost explore yourself creatively. But you always have that that still really great, rewarding artistic job to kind of center you. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So I think once I once I explained that to to my mom, she was she was totally on board, no. and I'm 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 hugely hugely grateful for that. My dad is my dad's great. He was like, yeah, as long as you're not, <laughs> you know, as long as, long as you're not, you know, as long <laughs> as you're not living under a bridge or something like that, you know, I'm I'm happy. So yeah, I was really lucky with that. Mm -hmm. No, no, I'm, I'm thank you for diving into. That. I appreciate you, you saying mm -hmm. all of that mm -hmm. because. It's always it's always great to hear, and I understand everyone has obviously their different stories, etc. We all come from different backgrounds. Um, I am I, I'm the same same as you. I'm very fortunate, and um, with my family, having my dad just telling me like or keeping me on the right track and uh, always backing what I want to do as a career wise, and it's uh, it's difficult sometimes though for a lot of people out there. I understand that maybe they're in a wee bit more of a difficult situation. It's kind of hard to get the point across of arc is um like there's so much uh, promising opportunities for artists as a career like there's lots of avenues to dive in it's not just um like literally art is used for everything um literally everything mm -hmm. like advertising mm -hmm. you name it uh from uh, the packaging you see on the food that you buy you name it there's literally so many different ways to make an income through art and it's just because obviously the way the generations work like they were told or they were taught a lot when they were younger um, like well things have ch just changed through the generations of you know what I mean and mm -hmm. when it mm -hmm. comes to this situation so if you are trying to um, get uh, get this point across to your family of right I want to be an artist the best advice I would give uh, that I would give is make sure you have a nine to five job because one thing that a lot of people uh, always respect is that as long as you're bringing an income you can then obviously focus on the art on your spare time um, I think that's super important like you were saying obviously about working at Starbucks like that's great and i think that's super important so everyone who's listening right now if you've got a normal job keep working at it and then um mm -hmm. when you get home mm -hmm. all you simply do is you uh, you put the time towards uh, making your art and you focus up and you keep working and um you just take it step at a time and one of the other things that you said was another great point to raise is the fact that a lot of us think that how can I say this best? That we have to do things so quickly. There's no, there's no rush. There's, um, you don't all have to just put all your eggs in one basket and say, right, I'm going down. I, I'm going to be an artist now. Like you can do all your hobbies, like you said there, Robert. Like you can keep doing those hobbies. Like don't try and force anything completely out your life because that day you want to still be human, still be yourself, and still feel relaxed and stuff. There's no pressure. Mm -hmm. I think these days in the way the industry has been run just the way the system goes is like you have to go to university or you have to go to college there's no pressure whatsoever i think that's the biggest um how can i say it? it's the, that's the that's the one downside i feel that it's kind of been forced at students these days like when they're in their secondary uh school they're being told right who do you want to be now and just to come up with that question out of nowhere it's not it's not an easy question to answer mm -hmm. i i agree with that so much i think that was a that was sort of an important thing for me coming out of high school because i still really had no idea mm -hmm. and um I, I knew a lot of people coming out of high school where they didn't have too much of an idea either but they're still running off to to university and that's partly because again that's what high school prepared them for that's what their parents expected that was sort of the idea is they finish high school go off to university even if you have no idea <laughs> what you want to do there, you know? So I knew a lot of people who started studying a whole bunch of different, you know, topics and stuff like that. But then after a year, they would come back home because it wouldn't work out and they maybe wouldn't feel connected or have the the necessary amount of work ethic. Mm -hmm. You know, high school is a breeze. Like I said, I spent my whole time basically drawing and sketching and, and messing around. 
you know, and I, I mean, <laughs> I got through it. It wasn't you you know, too much of a, yeah, yeah, it's not too much of a bother, right? So I, I kind of, I think I knew myself too coming out of, um, coming out of high school, and I was like, I'm not really ready to, to um, throw myself right into a, into a difficult setting. So maybe that's partly why it took a little while. I uh, kept on, yeah, just working jobs, you know, getting just life experience, I mm -hmm. guess. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good thing. I, I don't think there's, I think the world that we live in, people put a whole lot of pressure on you to act yes, right away yes. and make these and make these kind of big leaps without really fully understanding where you're leaping to and what you're leaping mm -hmm. over. And so, yeah, I think honestly, if you're kind of unsure, just yeah, get yourself a job, <laughs> you know, work, work for a year, maybe work for a couple of years, mm -hmm. keep on exploring yourself, you know, um, yeah, outside of work and yeah, I don't. I don't think there's nearly as much rush as, as most people feel. Yeah. In in today's society. Perfect, because it's it's always interesting how people like I understand stress. Like I get it when people experience stress, and I understand. Like I understand the worst of it. I've gone through it myself. I'm pretty sure we've all gone mm -hmm. through certain levels of stress, and mm -hmm. I completely acknowledge if people are going through a very maybe a dark period of time. They're trying to figure things out, but it's we we put so much pressure of like things have to be done now has to uh, like there's like i don't know if we don't get it now is our life's over but that's not the case like life's so easy i, I know this is so this is a, a bold statement for uh, for me to say but i think you can make your life so easy if you just realize in patience take your time and just trust the process like things always happen for a reason if you put the time in um you'll get the results that you get you, people say it all the time it never lies like every time right i ever hear a guest speaker at a presentation i'm always how can i say it? like i already know what they're going to say and i'm always kind of shocked how most people react like they they'll always uh, ask the most common questions like they'll ask the same thing they'll be like but how did you do this but even inside people know how they got there they they got there because of hard work they tried they failed they were they were okay to fail there's no there's no secret to life. Like a lot of people tend to like, we'll go in our Google search and we'll be like, how do I become the best at something? And mm -hmm. the, the answer is always the same. It's, there's no direct path. Like there's no easy, uh, easy path to getting where you want, but you, there's obviously steps you can uh, make the transition a wee bit more smoother, such as uh, trying to reach out to the right people, etc. There's, there's a lot of different things to figure out, but uh, I'm really glad that you shared all of that with us because it really makes uh it just makes it a lot easier for a lot of people to hear it coming from you because obviously you've recently got into the industry and it's great having uh like seeing your story and seeing what you've achieved so how does it feel getting your first job let's hear about it like what was it like get, getting the news that you got your first job in the industry it was great it was awesome i mean I, yeah i almost feel like i'm i was i was in, just really lucky with the way that it worked out mm -hmm. um so i don't think i'm i'm probably as um probably a little bit less common of an example. Sort of how it worked out is I was kind of cl getting closer to wrapping up my um, my demo reel. Mm -hmm. And there was uh, a mentor around the school who, was, who wasn't my mentor. So the way Think Tank works is typically one or two students will get in their last semester, they'll get paired up with a mentor. And that mentor will, of course, just guide them through their demo reel and give them feedback and sort of almost emulate maybe a, a director or a lead to a junior position, you know? So you have a, a, you know, weekly review with them where you'll look at things and they'll tell you what's working and what's not and all of that stuff. So there's a mentor around who wasn't my um, mentor, but I kind of noticed that every time she'd come in, um, she would sort of, you know, poke over my shoulder and, you know, kind of check out what I was working on. So I think eventually I just sort of said, you know, Oh, you know, do you want me to do a fly through or something like that? Um, so I showed her my scene and then it kind of uh, evolved a bit into every time she would come in for a mentorship session, she'd typically stick around for another, you know, five to 10 minutes just to see what I was working on and give me some feedback, which was really awesome. Um, and then that went forward a little bit more. And eventually she came in and she said, oh, by the way, when you're when you're finished, you're real, you know, um, send it into Hellbent where I'm working. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, you know, that sounds, that sounds great. 
And then a little bit past that, I ran into her and she said, oh, we're actually, you know, we're looking for a new junior environment artist, like as soon as possible. I don't care if you're done, just just send me what you have, if it's images or if it's an early sequence, you know, of the reel with a bit of editing work or something like that. So I sent that to her. And then a couple of days later, I think I got an email from mm -hmm. Hellbent. I yep. uh, got an interview and the interview went really well. We talked about, they're, they're awesome at Hellbent. Like their biggest question was like, what do you what do you play? Like, what's your favorite video game? Like oh, everything else. Like, important I, I was, question. Was, That's what I'm talking about. It was funny because I went in. I was talking about. It, I was like, oh, I really wish that I spent a bit more time on the on the on the foliage, and you know, because we were looking at my reel, and I was like, and the lighting was off here, and I was like, I kind of wanted to show that I was aware that it wasn't perfect, you know, and I was still thinking about how to improve it because mm -hmm. I wasn't totally done. Um. And they're like, oh no, like we don't, we don't care. <laughs> like, what, what video games do you play? I was that's, like, oh, that's wow. <laughs> this is this is amazing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and then after that, I think maybe a couple of days, you know, they sent me a job offer, and so the whole thing happened before I finished my reel. And what I think is really cool, I was gonna say this on the rookies, but uh, I sort of forgot to mention it. But it was it was a super satisfying first day because I was about to jump on the bus, you know, to my first day. Mm -hmm. And that was that was when I kind of posted all of my stuff on ArtStation and everything. So it was like my first day was also the completion of my demo reel, which is it was yeah, <laughs> pretty yeah. pretty pretty eventful uh, day. It was sort of a nice, super kind of abrupt transition mm -hmm. into doing your demo reel to then working working in industry. Wow. It's mm -hmm. it's a, it's a crazy it's uh <laughs> it, it's great though it's amazing like you said there as well like when it comes to um getting the interview process like I understand that when it, when it's your first one like your actual first one it's like I understand that a lot of people will be really nervous about it and it's easy for me to say just be yourself like that's a famous phrase like people are all just be yourself just be yourself but one of the things that I think is super important is like to bring up discussion that's or ask a question that's just generally fun like right off the bat like I, i've mentioned this twice now in the podcast so when i went into one of my uh, major interviews um in the past i just started geeking out about game of thrones like i was just <laughs> like have you been here did you watch the last episode of game of thrones and they're like hell yeah let's talk about it let's go <laughs> so we just talked about game of thrones for the first 20 20 20 minutes 30 minutes or whatnot and uh because of that we were, we were all able to like kind of relax and uh, everyone kind of got um their kind of jitters out or whatever you want to call it their nerves away and uh we just start talking about art it was brilliant and i think that simple um addition to or just doing something so simple like that can make things 10 times easier and you have to always remember when it comes to interviews right they want you to succeed they've like they've not invited you over there to try and ambush you <laughs> that's not their mm -hmm. goal like they're not going to be like right robert we're going to be playing the most <laughs> intense game of chess you've ever seen <laughs> prepare yourself if you do not win you will be fired straight away yeah. we have it's, hardcore metal music playing in the background yeah, exactly yeah. <laughs> Gu guitar hero battle on the left as well yeah uh, yeah got, got to include it it's... that's yeah i i think that's a really good point that most interviews and hellbent was like that too where um i wasn't just interviewing with one person i was interviewing with i think it was four people so there was the ceo chris mm -hmm. uh the art director e-man the lead environment artist brandon okay and then the lead tech artist scott and at first I was like, oh my God, like four people interviewing, like this is going to be intense. But I actually think that the reason that they did it was so that it would create a more just kind of a, just a, a conversational discussion format. Because mm -hmm. eventually we all sat down, we all started talking and, you know, it was, it was like, it was like five people sitting down and just having a conversation, right? Where Scott maybe met, would mention something and Brandon would be saying something to him while E-Man was asking me a question and it really it really took the pressure off compared to just having a one on one interview yeah it's like, so it's, it's a nice it's a nice format for it mm -hmm. no that's interesting like uh, i've always been so i've had a few interesting in depth conversations about interviews in the past on the podcast and uh, i've always wondered what people think is best for them would they prefer one versus like i just said one versus one as if it's a competition <laughs> <laughs> one versus one fight go <laughs> <laughs> um, or having four people i don't know like for me well i, I guess it depends on the situation but 
I tend to thrive best when it's one v one. I think that's when I when I do better. However, oh, okay. mm-hmm. I do see where you're coming from, though. I think that is that is a good advantage as well. Plus, it's kind of it's it's not like you're having to always like sit in front of each other. At least there's like there's almost like a like a round table kind of approach. Where there's four of you, it's like you're looking around. It's not having just to be one person right in front of you. So I, I know what you mm-hmm. mean there. I think that, I think that's an interesting uh, and important thing to bring up. Yeah, it would have been different if all of them were kind of crowded around me, making you know intense eye contact <laughs> and grilling me with questions. But so that that would be terrible. If I was in if I was in almost a, a hostile interview scenario, I would probably rather have, as you said, one opponent yeah. instead of you know four. <laughs> <One opponent. laughs> but but I think I kind of have a feeling that the the reason that they did that, I mean, also just I, so I guess they all got a chance to meet me. Mm-hmm. But I kind of I have a little feeling that they did that partly as a as a way to sort of settle the room a little bit and again, take some of that uh, stress and tension away. And I wanted to mention this before I forget, this is maybe, this is maybe a bit of a hot take. Oh, you I'm go. sure Let's hear probably it. quite a lot of people would uh, disagree with me here, but you know, people say when you go into an interview, you want to be smooth, confident, capable. This might be crazy, but I've been thinking about this a bit recently, but maybe especially for your first job, I don't think it's the worst thing to show up a little bit nervous and a little bit shy. I mean, as you said, show up as as who you are. Yeah. So if you are super cool, super confident, if you're that sort of personality, then yeah, then show up that way. But for me, I'm always a little bit, I can be a little bit shy or a little bit anxious. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, I don't think it hurts that much, especially with your first job, because I was thinking about this and I think it shows in a way that it's a big deal to you. Yeah, it shows you care. Yeah, it shows that you care and it shows that you're excited and, you know, and I mean, you still don't want to show up as like a a complete ball of nerves, (laughs) you know, but I think a little bit of, I think it shows in a way kind of humility. I think on the opposite aspect of that, if you show up completely nonchalant, you know, and you sit back and you put your feet up on the table, (laughs) you know, and you act like you're, you don't care whether it kind of goes your way or not, you're just all cool with it. Mm-hmm. then I, I think that shows the wrong message. So I guess it's a balance. I think really the trick is just to show up as you would typically show up. But I, I think I hear that a lot where you want to go and, you know, people say, oh, you want to dominate the interview. Oh, you want to, you know, you know, show strength. It's all in the handshake. And to, maybe it's just our industry, but we're in an industry of of nerdy people who love movies and video games and fantasy. And yep. nobody's nobody's expecting that. You know, it's like going to your weekly D&D group. <laughs> you know, acting all, you know, uh, tough and confident. I think most people are just looking for somebody who feels, you know, humble and kind and excited and passionate about what they do. So yeah. that that's my hot take is maybe don't worry too much about being, you know, uh, you know, the, the fawns or whatever <laughs> in an interview. Maybe just kind of, you know, yeah, act like yourself. And I don't think it's the worst thing to show. Yeah, a little bit of who you are if that is a little bit of nervousness or of a little bit of shyness i'm dude i'm happy you said that no that's great i, I completely agree <laughs> with you there's nothing wrong with saying that at all that's uh at the end of the day we a lot of people overthink so many things and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I get it and that obviously shows that you care and there's there's you just have to be you and i know i said that i guess it's easy for me to say that but at the end of the day like they've They've reached out to you because they, like you, if you've got the interview stage right, they know you can do the work. They're, yeah, they're, they, have, yeah. they have trust there already. Like that trust is already embedded. They're just, they're just checking to see if you're, you're human. Like you're okay. Yeah, yeah if you're not a robot. Yeah. And you said, <laughs> and you said an important thing that is, is so obvious. It's like it be nervous. It's, it's okay. Like if you are nervous, that's all right because, like you said, it's okay. It shows that you care. It shows that you want to be there. And mm-hmm. that's one of the most important things ever. It's like you want to show that you that you want to be a part of that team. You want to be a part of that studio, and um, that will come across as just the way you're acting, and it's and it's fine. So there's there's uh, there's nothing wrong with a wee bit of nerves. And uh, like you said, nerves nerves is a good thing. Like just, nerves is not a negative thing. I think a lot of people put too much. Uh, um, how can I say it? Too much value around, or too much pressure on nerves. Ner- nerves, nerves is very beneficial. Like take professional athletes, take any well any profession. Nerves mm-hmm. is what mm-hmm. separates them or gives them that, them that little 
a uh, wee bit more of motivation to do, to do well like like for example if they're thinking oh i'm not going to get it. they're going to try even harder to get it and that's going to put them at advantage even more it's it's you can sometimes you can be too calm too relaxed it's like you said there <laughs> if you're too chilled or like you're too as of like oh i i don't i don't mind what's going to happen then obviously that's not that's not the mindset you want to show <laughs> yeah so, yeah exactly that'll sort of work against you because they think well this guy doesn't seem super enthused and you know yeah. excited about the idea of working here you know he's acting like he's you know the bell of the ball or whatever and he's got a mm-hmm. hundred other opportunities so and again maybe it's partly our field like i you know uh maybe if i was in like business commerce <laughs> it might be a totally different thing right yeah maybe that idea you know maybe maybe that's a field where you really need to show that you're you're kind of able to again be super super calm and collected but i think in our industry it's it's fine right most people are most people are human and most people appreciate those things in other people I know for myself, you know, when I, I don't know, I, I really like people that show that sort of humility. I'm instantly drawn to them. If I go into a room and I see somebody who's not sort of trying to take up, you know, all the space or not really sort of um, trying to be too loud, <laughs> really sell themselves all the time. You know, if somebody's just kind of there and they're themselves, I find that's, um, I think most people do. I think most people are drawn to that. Yeah. That's awesome. So, well, as we continue this subject, because it's it, it's an important one. So when you think about, or like, what what advice would you give to current students? That's, because obviously you've just started an industry. Is mm-hmm. there anything that stands out to you that could have made your transition more easier? I know obviously you said it was a wee bit of a an interesting way of getting in. Like you didn't expect it. It's not your typical, all right, it's time to send applications. I know you did, so you you were going through that process, but an opportunity arose and you took it, which was great. And and that's what I would have done. But is there anything, any um, other tips or advice that you would give that could make that transition of just get starting industry and make it a lot easier for yourself? Well, yeah, it's almost, it's actually, uh, it's, it's, it's a super wacky experience for me because I I wasn't even sending out applications yet. Right. Cause I was Mm -hmm. still in the process of finishing out my demo reel. And for me, I was very nervous about writing cover letters and trying to get in touch with recruiters and and doing the whole LinkedIn LinkedIn hustle, you know, <laughs> trying to oh. connect with different people and you know that whole thing. To me, it's um, it's maybe something that I've never, yeah. You know, I, I guess I would say I'm probably comp, you know, competent in it, but it's always a bit of a, a struggle for me to kind of uh, promote myself or really get out there. And so I was I was sort of dreading that a little bit. I was actually kind of like. I was really around the last month of doing my demo reel, right as I was getting close to finishing it, I was like on cloud nine <laughs> because I was realizing that after this, it was going to be that hustle of of looking for jobs and that kind of stuff. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to be having a hell of a lot more fun working on this scene that I'm working on, that I'm attached to, than, than again, kind of playing the game and trying to get in touch with recruiters and sending out emails and applications. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, it's almost I feel like the advice that I could give. I think it's I think it's a pretty good piece of advice, but it's maybe not um, the most uh, what's the word for it the most general advice you could give. But I think for me, the way it worked out is just just talk to people and be happy, you know, to to show what you're working on and be passionate about what you're doing. If you're working in a school like like me, if mm-hmm. there are teachers coming in or there are mentors. You know, don't be afraid to ask for some feedback from them. Uh, you know, ask them what's working. Be be happy to show your stuff. If you're just, you know, self-taught and working from home, you know, hop on discords. You know, there are a ton of amazing discords out there right now, like the EXP Discord. Uh, I think 80 Level has one. Oh, there's so many. <laughs> the Dynasty Empire. There's there's so many amazing places to reach out to people and get feedback. That and that's a, that's a you know that's a super cool thing honestly about our day and age and the internet and stuff like that right if you think yeah, back there's so much opportunity you know, 50 years or something like that there's none of that so yeah internet's i mean that's a whole other <laughs> topic to get into but i think of all the cool things that the internet does it's that it can take people in completely different parts of the world and bring them together into this same communal setting so i think take advantage of that and you never know right if you're posting your stuff in discords or or forums and reaching out to people that's you're you're a lot more likely to to catch somebody's attention who has that kind of sway to get you into the industry Mm -hmm. i feel like that's a more natural 
avenue to take than just sending in applications. Yeah. Because most studios are getting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of applications, you know, all the time. And you're just going to get lost in the in the shuffle unless your work is like holy grail style, <laughs> you know, unless it's so far above the rest that people will look at it and it'll blow their minds. I think, at least for me, I always like the idea more of, yeah, I, I guess of that more natural sense of networking where yeah. you just, yeah, you connect with people and it works out. So that would be my, that would be my advice. But mm. I, I, I kind of almost consider myself, um, uh, I, I guess a one-off. Like, I do think I got really lucky because, you know, it's almost like a, <laughs> this is another tangent, but it's like a self-help book where it's like, you know, you somebody says, "Oh, I did these the, these steps and it worked for me." So if you do those steps, you're golden. It'll work for you. But really, I mean, life doesn't. There's so many random different oh. circumstances that would affect that, right? So anything Completely I could say, agree. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say uh, any specific steps. But I think, yeah, just be always trying to improve, always asking questions. And also be happy to show what you have, even if you know that it's got some mistakes and stuff like that. I mean, maybe don't put, you know, something that you're really not confident with on your art station or something, but yeah, post it in a post it in a Discord or message a friend about it. Or, you know, if you're at a school, ask a teacher, ask a mentor or something like that. Just connect with people. And I think that leads to, a, it'll lead to a lot more avenues than if you don't connect with anybody. Yeah. It's, it's you can't all... really, yeah, you can't really lose if you're just yeah reaching out perfect no amazing answer thanks for diving into so much depth because that's crazy right you just answered my next four questions in a row in one <laughs> I mean, that's why i just kept letting you speak I'm, i was I'm like prepared yeah <laughs> he's thinking this through um because wow right okay right time to devour that that's brilliant i love it i love it this because mm. so the first one that caught my attention because obviously it was the first thing that you said which i found very interesting. This is something that I feel that I'm trying to that I try to get across on the podcast as much um, as I can. But I think the biggest mistake lots of students make is is that they only think of networking and the studio stuff and um, actually getting employed when they get in their final year. And I think that's the biggest mistake. I understand we don't all have answers yet, and I know it's it's um it takes time to figure out what we want to apply for but say for example you guys are in environment art and you're trying to figure out right what job do i want to uh, where do i want to work say if you want to work for a particular studio in those early years of you finding that answer out do your research like figure out places that are looking for artists and um, ask those people for advice do what robert was saying so network get involved reach out to people in that circle that are going to be able to enhance your career and make that transition a lot more smoother the biggest mistake so many people fall in is the biggest trap is that they expect that when they go uh, when they finish their degree they're guaranteed something out of it that's never the case it's down to what you put in because yes it's all down to the quality of the art and the art dictates whether or not you'll get a job in that but in order for your work to be noticed it, that's that's you that like you have to get your 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 work out there um like robert was saying reaching out to people joining discords joining communities and most importantly not necessarily being afraid of uh, uh getting your work um out there as well like um i understand there's a lot of people who are very nervous about showing their work because maybe they struggle with maybe getting critique back and i think uh, critique is such an important thing it changes the game and at the day when you get into the industry we're gonna be we're gonna be failing all the time it's okay and that's what that's what we want it's all about mistakes it's all about trial and error there's so many people in place to help you and like that's why obviously you had a mentor which is great you had a mentor at think tank supporting you along your way you learn different things from that but i think it's super important when you are trying to make that step into getting your first job just every i don't know every month just just every now and then just have a think about it right what would i be interested in doing do i want to get into AAA? do i maybe want to do a small go into a small company and build 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 my way up i think another trap that we tend to think of too much is that we have to get into AAA straight away there's nothing wrong with going into an indie a smaller indie studio or whatever and building your um building up going through the diff the the different rankings so to speak um, for me personally, I think smaller studios are a lot better for me personally. Maybe the bigger studio is better for you. I started mm -hmm. off in architecture and I was surrounded by a team 
of well the full team there was about 30 of us but in terms of my area there were six of us and i know that's the same for you uh robert at your studio there's about seven of you including your lighting artists and yeah like yeah. that's a that's a really nice environment to be in like and that might be the right choice and what what's your thoughts on the whole small studio versus big studio um situation it's a bit hard to say for me um i think my experience so far has just been at Hellbent, which is which is a small studio. I think we're just under forty people. I think we're thirty eight or thirty nine people, mm-hmm. um, and it's it's awesome. Like it is a really nice. It feels very communal, um, and it's a bit hard for me to know if I was in a bigger studio. I never. I was in a pretty big high school. Uh, I mean, my elementary school was it was pretty average, but my high school was super big. And there's this thing where I didn't really it felt quite anonymous. Like I didn't know all the people in my grade and coming out of elementary school where I knew everybody and I knew all the teachers. And I always liked that. Like I felt more attached and I felt more engaged by that setting. Mm -hmm. Whereas being, you know, and, and that's not even getting to, I never went to a formal university, uh, but somewhere like in Vancouver, somewhere like UBC, you know, there are lecture halls of 300 plus people where you'll basically never have a one-on-one, you know, with your professor because he's too busy doing other stuff like if you're lucky you'll get five minutes of his time and he's probably so stressed and overworked that he's going to give you a blunt answer that you barely understand you know if it's about how to hand something in or what you know whatever it is you know and then you're gonna get kicked out of the door and that always just seemed like i i think knowing myself and knowing an environment like that Mm -hmm. i always felt like that that wouldn't be right for me you know I, i i definitely prefer smaller intimate same uh, environments so uh, yeah i think looking at it that way i'm not sure if i really would thrive at a at a bigger studio i guess it's a conflict too because if you really want to be working on those on those huge games that are pushing the boundaries as far as art and tech and everything goes um you know then you're it might be hard to find that without trying to get into a big studio Mm -hmm. um so i'm still almost trying to piece it together Perfect. for myself a little bit finding the great you know the best best environment for me but no, yeah hellbent's sure. Hellbent been it's been great so far that's awesome you can't <laughs> be it. it is nice <laughs> being part of it yeah like you said being just being a part of a team of six or seven people is really it's nice because you, mm-hmm. you, you it's like you said you, you get to know them but you actually get mm-hmm. to like there's been many places in which i've had to obviously be like say teams of i don't know 40 artists uh, to 50 artists on my one team uh, in that one area and that's a lot of people to get to know and then there's situations um so when i was working with disney there was only there was only like four of us and it was great nice. <laughs> and, that, and i was like happy <laughs> days fun, yeah. sorted and it made it so much easier and uh, like i said when i was in uh, working in oil i had such a small team and because that was my first time like you first time starting an industry yes it wasn't game or film it was um i was still doing 3d i was doing architecture for them but Mm -hmm. because of that that made me so much more comfortable and the big point i want to get from this is once again don't have to you don't have to jump the gun so quickly it's the same with education you don't have to rush to university straight after you finish um straight after you you finish secondary school if you're if you're if you're generally struggling because i know there's a lot of places out there that charge way too much money um, and they don't give you the value that you deserve and mm-hmm. that's why research i still think is very undervalued by a lot of people or they're not getting told or taught the importance of research research can save you so much money and being patient like the one of the most the, the thing i learned so much over the years was learning how to be a patient person i think patience has been the best thing i've learned learning how to just realize trust in time and not having to like put so much pressure on myself and it really helps make the the career path way more smoother and you've said like a lot of other um great topics um in that discussion as well such as um getting like, for example getting your work out there so the thing that helped you get your get your work out there was first of all uh, applying to the rookies and mm-hmm. um applying to the rookies i remember you were saying that you were like, oh, I don't think my work's maybe the best. I, I'm not sure if I'd uh, be able to compete. And then guess what happened, man? You won it, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Uh, which is still the, it's still the, I don't know, it's still the craziest thing to me. <laughs> oh, dude, it's so you know, cool. It's like, it's like once these kind of, you know, uh, once once a big thing happens, I find typically things normalize a bit. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you get your first job and you're like, for the first month, you're like, oh, my 
oh my god, I can't believe that this is actually happening. But eventually, you know, you kind of adapt, and it, and it just becomes part of everyday life. But with the rookies still looking back, I'm like, holy hell. <laughs> it just the way that it worked out is, yeah, yeah it's insane to me. The, the, the and cool I have been, I have been very, um, I've kind of, I've spent maybe longer than I should, I guess maybe, you know, that idea of like, don't look a gift horse in the mouth or something, or, or if there's good news, maybe just sort of accept it as good news. But I can't help but sort of analyze and be like, why did I win? I, you know, compared to all these other amazing projects, like even, you know, Blaj, who was on the podcast three weeks back, maybe yeah. two weeks back or something. You're a legend if you're listening, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Blaj, we love you. Um, <laughs> But you know, comparing my scene to his scene, and I'm trying I'm not trying to be self-deprecating or anything, but on a technical level, his prop work is just it's it's mind boggling to it's, me. It's great. Oh. Like I, I would I would pay to have him teach me a course of mm -hmm. prop work and ZBrush work because it's insane. And he had so much the sore and the helmet and all the dragon sculptures and the little Buddhas and even just the furniture was so oh, intricate with the, the details furniture. and I remember us talking to him about it while, because um, we've had you know a bit of a correspondence over the years, uh, and he was showing me some of the props he was doing. Mm -hmm. I was like, I was like, oh, really cool, man! Like nice furniture. Like where did you find those uh, like alphas? You know, because he had all these amazing designs. I was like, no, no, I just I just did it all by hand. And I was like, oh my god! And then I was like, how long did it take you? He was like, oh, you know, like a like a day of work. <laughs> and I was sitting there like, oh my god, that's insane. So. I'm still kind of when I when I look at his his you know project and a bunch of other projects too. It's kind of I'm still a little bit confused about how I actually ended up Dude. winning. And and I've had and I've maybe had some ideas or things that I'm proud about mm -hmm. through Iro's bookstore. Uh, and maybe we could touch on that a little bit. But of I'm course. still kind of I kind of really maybe I should uh, send Alwyn a message or something and just say like I kind of wanted to. I was you know. Hey, thanks, you know, so much for for everything, but like why why me, I guess. Well, <laughs> that's sort of been my my thinking, but then again, it's probably not worth dwelling on, you know, too much, but I well, I would say like so obviously when I was talking to Bosch, he, he's insane. Like I had so much fun talking to him, really great mm. artists and uh like for example, like I anytime I see furniture, you know I'm going to geek out, man. Like if I yeah, see, if, yeah, yeah. If, if I if I see any detail, like I was just I, I was just talking to him for uh, like I said to you, I think I talked to him for about four hours. Uh, but that's this is like bef before and after. <laughs> we were just talking about Sauron, the greatness of Lord of the Rings. <laughs> we were just geeking out for ages. It was it was just so much fun. But it's mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's that's the thing though. It's everyone. It's like you you, you never know what to expect. You you're only going to find out if you try and. The cool thing is as well, like obviously he's had so many great opportunities as well. T today he was on the Rookies podcast, so mm -hmm. it's like it's, it's so funny. So I'm talking to you when you were on theirs last <laughs> week, and then I talked to him pretty much a few weeks ago. So it's like a, a little swap over. <laughs> we've 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 crisscrossed a little bit. Yeah, yeah. it's crazy. <laughs> uh -huh. But no, like dude, you did amazing work, and at the day, it's Thank you. You, you deserve it. Like, I, like I'm going to give you the praise because I know you made amazing work. Everyone was saying in like like i said with art station comments everybody wanted to live in that place in your piece like when we everyone saw iro's <laughs> workshop here were like uh the bookshop uh etc uh or bookstore um you name it everyone was like god it'd be great to be there it was such a amazing atmosphere the vibe was just spectacular the way you lit lit things lighting i know you got t um a lot um things taught about lighting and the importance of lighting but Dude, I would never sell yourself short. You, you, you did great. You both, you, you both did great. There is, but I do agree. The standard is insane. But that, but that's the best thing. The standard these days of art is skyrocketed because obviously opportunities has um, got a lot better with software developing. You name. There's been so much things growing in the industry. Um, well, that's actually one of my questions I want to ask you. This is a, this is something I haven't asked in a long time. You as a mm. student, right? when you were starting mm -hmm. out how did it how like what's your thoughts do you think it's the industry is getting too saturated because i think there's so much stuff now getting shared that if i was a student it'd be too hard to keep up mm -hmm. yeah that that's an interesting question um it's sort of hard to say i guess because i i don't think things have shifted too much 
right. uh, from a couple of years ago when I first entered as a student. But I definitely get that aspect where, you know, sometimes it can be hard going on on uh, ArtStation. And sometimes I can find it even a little bit, you know, uh, demotivating or something in the way where if I'm kind of, you know, struggling to outside of work, stay motivated and keep on doing personal stuff. Mm hmm. I'll hop on and I'll see some guy who, you know, works at some big studio, maybe works at Epic or something like that. And then they have, you know, um, oh, what's that word for it? I can't think of it, but um, they'll have, you know, so many solo projects. It, it looks like they're, you know, pushing out one a month or something and they're amazing. And it's looking at that. Sometimes I find like, I'm like, oh my God, how can I? how can I keep up with that? Maybe it's experience, you know, maybe it's because they're senior and they've been doing it for so long that they just yeah. know all of the steps to take, you know, with a personal project, they're good with planning. They know what their strengths are, you know, and they just, they can just get them done really quick. But I find that, you know, and then if you, and then if you multiply that by like hundred thousand, <laughs> you know, or all the people along ArtStation, right? You, you hop on ArtStation, you just see the front page and it's just so full of amazing work. It's a lot to absorb. That, yeah, it's a lot to absorb, and I kind of maybe get what you mean about it sort of being oversaturated because stuff just moves so fast. And these amazing projects come out, and then a big game comes out, and there's these huge art dumps, you know, like like you know with The Last of Us Two and before that. I mean, there are tons of games that come out and have this, but I remember the one for um, God of War, like the art dump for oh, that was, that was just amazing, insane. It's like Art Station just you know blew up for like two weeks, you know, with that. And same with The Last of Us Two and yeah, there's there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff to it's keep non, up with, and I'm I'm not sure if I actually have too much uh, advice for that because that's something I sort of struggle with a bit too. But I kind of get what you mean about it. Sometimes feeling like yeah, there's just a lot of amazing stuff out there, and it can feel kind of uh, stressful comparing yourself with it. But I think you kind of fall into that trap of you know comparing your singular self with with the whole. Mm -hmm. it's easy to look at all of art station almost as this entity <laughs> that you're yeah. kind of up against sometimes i kind of do that where i look at the front page of art station and i think like, oh my god again i kind of almost think of all these separate artists doing their own thing as this one collective body <laughs> <laughs> i know it sounds kind of goofy but uh you know so i guess it, it's cliche advice but i guess just try not to stress it too much yeah, or or compare yourself it. too directly everybody's always at a different stage in their in their learning you know if you think about it like a like a curve or whatever everybody's always at a different part of that curve um and yeah i i think it's just okay to realize that and a good thing too is you know uh, well people always also say this oh never compare yourself to others it's never healthy i i think that's ridiculous because we're social creatures that's how we function somebody who never compares themselves to others is they're not fit for society, right? No you're, matter you're what you learn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's how we learn. We watch our parents and we watch what other people do and what works. I guess there's just a productive way to do it and an unproductive way. And the productive way is to say, wow, this person, again, working uh, at, at a big studio and, you know, is incredibly... Um, productive with doing you know these personal projects is to just try and break it down and think okay what are they doing correctly how are they optimizing their workflow you know treat it as a way to learn um which can be a bit of a struggle sometimes because i think it is easy to flip in that other direction and again sort of become dejected and become stressed yeah by it so yeah, yeah adds, i i, I wouldn't up. say yeah don't compare yourself with others but just do it in a in a pragmatic productive um optimistic positive way yeah. <laughs> don't no, fall no. to the other side where you're you know again getting down on yourself because that does that does nothing perfect thank you very much because mm -hmm. when it comes to so the one point i wanted to raise with this and uh, you touched on a lot of different things there which which is super important and the one thing though for me so i got into a habit of uh following too many people so mm. the one thing i want to talk about here is when you have so many people, like say, for example, you subscribe to, I don't know, 30 channels on YouTube and then lots of, there's almost like conflict in, in advice. And that's why I kind of keep my, my scope quite small. Like I, I, I'm only subscribed to like four or five people on YouTube and mm. there's a reason for it because I feel like sometimes I'm getting flooded with too much information 
and it's the same on different uh, on social media like because i used to follow like so many people like i said so i've kind of dialed things back and i've uh, only kind of follow people that i'm like 100 percent certain like that i trust if that makes sense i know that sounds kind of obvious but it's there's so many different ways to learn there's like there's like 50 podcasts now out there that i've seen uh all mm-hmm. doing art and it's like the best advice I would give if you're listening to so many podcasts, yes, it's great listening to lots of different people, but maybe find the podcast that fits you best, if you know what I mean. Or maybe mm-hmm. find the, the your artist that's going to fit like you best once again. it's it's I think it's uh, because there's so much information getting shared these days, it's kind of hard to keep up. And if you're struggling, like dial things back a wee bit, figure out how to make your job easier instead of having so much information, you're struggling how to kind of break things down, if that makes sense. Would, would you agree? Absolutely. I know. I think that's a great piece of advice that um, I don't think I've actually really heard that one very much, which is, yeah, no, I I, I need to follow that more, too, because <laughs> my subscriptions on YouTube are all over the place. Like I have the same YouTube channel that I've had ever since I was like 11. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, I've, I'm subscribed to so many things that it's almost just even overwhelming for me to go through and clear it out. So I'm sure I'm subscribed to like 100 channels that are no longer even making <laughs> Probably Whoa, more. That's so I need to. I need to do some. Yeah, I need to do some. Uh, some spring cleaning, <laughs> for sure. And same with ArtStation too. I'm following a lot of people in ArtStation, and you know, I mean, it's it's hard, right? Because I I love to see what people come up with, especially if I look through somebody's work and I just think this person is like the the coolest. Yeah. Um, but I think you're right. Like it, it's gotten to a point for me where I have so many notifications coming in every day mm-hmm. about new stuff. That yeah, oftentimes I'm just I'm I'm busy doing other stuff, or again it's just it's overwhelming. So I don't even, it's like yeah, I guess that whole too much of a good thing is is a bad thing almost. Yeah. Where it's like you know you could you know there are so many amazing people on on ArtStation and on all of these different sort of platforms. But you know you would like to be able to stay on top of all of them, but that's it's like it's too much for any one singular entity <laughs> yeah. to deal with. So I think that's a really good piece of advice that I should follow. I should go and do some spring cleaning and think, what am I really using this platform for? Or what am yeah. I hoping to get out of it? Because one of the traps, right, that I realized that this, well, this is what I was taught from one of my lectures. This is going to sound obvious once again, but one of my lectures was saying literally all his students would be asking, right, what's the best tutorial? What's the best tutorial? And they'd be subscribed to everything. But what's the thing that they're missing? They're they're not actually doing. They're not doing anything. <laughs> they're not actually doing the craft. It's like it makes so much sense. But because we're we think that we're gaining the knowledge, like for example, I could tell everyone lots of advice in the podcast, but it's implementation that's king. Yet you can listen, etc. Um, and um, I'm obviously I'm I'm no perfect. I, was, I, I that's why I like to bring on guests to share their knowledge because because uh, <laughs> uh, they're like a lot talented more than me. It's great hearing all their advice, etc. And we learn from each other. Um, but it's all about implementation. It's one thing I think so many people forget. It's it's always the doing. It's obvious and frustrating. Some people, uh, you may find it, but on the day it's all about. You just have to do it and keep doing it until it works out. So. You said mm-hmm. quite a few mm-hmm. interesting things, right? That I'm so happy you brought up. And because of obviously our situation at the moment with COVID, I wanted to ask you this because this is the first chance I'm going to be able to ask this because at the moment, a lot of people are still applying to jobs. They're trying mm-hmm. to um, get themselves into industry. And the one thing that's the biggest change though is a lot of people are now being remote. So they're having to work from home. And I know you're having to work from home at the moment. And Yeah, yeah. What what what's it be, what's it what's it like working from home? And is there any advice you would give to people who are going to have to go into that situation? You know, well, this is actually kind of interesting. Um, with my, it was it was kind of funny because when I did the um, the rookies interview, mm-hmm. it was right that weekend. So I just moved into a new place. Okay. And so that interview was like my last, my my second last night or something at my old place. I was saying, oh, it's a little bit of a, it's a bit of a challenge staying focused and it, it's more, it's more effort working from home than it is when you're in studio. Somehow when you're in studio, you're surrounded by people who are also working, you feel inspired. There's kind of, there's, it's just a different environment. So it's kind of a struggle shifting your home environment, especially because I'm not, you know, I'm not living big enough to actually be able to afford to have a workspace that's separate from my living space. <laughs> Which also I hear that's that's an advice which people give is that you don't want to have you want to have three different spaces for the most part. You want the space where you sleep, 
You want yep. the space where you work, and then you want the space the space where you relax, your recreation space. And it's kind of, if you can keep those separate, it just helps you shift gears more. If everything's all happening at once in the same space, if you're if it's your sleep area, also the place where you might watch, you know, game a bit or watch movies or something, and it's your workspace, it's like, I don't know, your brain somehow, it's all jumbled up <laughs> it's like almost all of you i don't know too much about uh you know brain chemistry and psychology but it's like all of your kind of neurons are firing in all those different directions all at once because everything's wrapped up in this space so if you can i think a good thing to do would probably be to try and separate that yeah but one thing i've noticed actually since moving into this new place and i've only been i've been here for under a week but my uh, my old apartment it was a basement suite and it was it was rough <laughs> like, not, not the best <laughs> It was super cheap. I moved in there because I was still in school and I didn't want to be paying a whole lot of money when I didn't have any income. Also, I had some friends from school who were living there. So that was kind of a draw too. Mm -hmm. um, but they all, it was funny because they all, they all left. They all moved out, uh, especially when COVID happened. So I, at first it was this nice space where I was with these friends from school and I could deal with all of the, the holes in the ceiling and, and the horrible bathroom, you know, that you'd have to fight off mold because it had no circulation and stuff. Um, but once they moved out, it was like I was in this big, empty basement suite with hardly any light coming in, you know, just by myself. And I, I found that pretty tough, to be honest, especially staying on top of work and staying inspired and staying in the zone. Um, so since I moved to this new place, it's it's awesome. <laughs> I have way more natural light. I'm, I'm living with my with my older brother, who's also in the games industry. He's a programmer. All right. Okay. Awesome. Perfect. So it's like it's, it's almost like we're um, we're a little microcosm studio environment, right? <laughs> Where we'll both go and get coffee and we'll talk about stuff. And I just wish we were not working at the same studios. That would be that would be awesome if we were. Uh, but that's it's been really nice. So I, maybe my piece of advice, and that was again, I'm sorry, it was pretty long winded, but um, is I try and I guess optimize your space if you can't separate your workspace from your living space try and at least create an environment where you're comfortable and inspired. Because I think that probably, I think that affects people more than they realize. Like I didn't realize when I was living at this other kind of rat's nest of an apartment, I was like, ah, oh, it's fine. You know, it's not affecting me too much. But I think now being in a different space, I'm realizing how, how an unhealthy space can create sort of, you know, a less healthy lifestyle and less healthy work habits. And so I think it's important to just try and you know, even just keep your desk clear, you know, keep things yeah. organized, keep things focused. Um, I think that helps a lot. Dude, ama insane answer. I appreciate it. I've never been able to talk <laughs> about that. So when you said you were going on for too long, I was like, keep talking, bro. Keep talking. Great. Okay. <laughs> that was, um, what? So I talked about what only once in this podcast, like, I really need to talk about it more. So I talked about what my life was like in university because I like, uh, yeah, I like, I was obsessed. I'm pretty sure you were the same. Like all I did was work. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, yes, I still did my sport and that, but I, I took a big hit in the, in the food side of things. I, I dropped like three and a half stone when I was at, um, when I was studying, cause all I focused on was work. And mm -hmm. you said a lot of really important things there, which was, um, like you said about the space knowing um how to live correctly like i'll we like it's like i know there's so many people listening right now maybe their diet's not on point maybe they're they're not doing a, a lot of fitness um you guys hear me a lot i like to talk about fitness and the importance of that even just walking like you don't need to love sport i'm just saying go out for a walk it can really change things so i walk every day i run every day and that even if it's only 20 mm -hmm. minutes maybe it's 10 minutes if you're working uh, if you're just getting into the industry and you're trying to absorb, like when you when you first start, right, there, there's a lot of information f coming at you, and you're like, "Whoa, I did not expect this. I did never, <laughs> I never got taught this in uni." So what do you do? You take a step back and you go, "Right, I'm off for a walk." And what what's that do? It makes you reset. It's the same with having water at the front of your desk. Like have a sticky note. So this is what I always used to do. Um, I've I don't have to do this anymore because I've, it's now ingrained in my head. But I used to have a sticky note, right? Uh, on my mm -hmm. monitor so uh, at work and it'd be like water uh, food and break <laughs> <laughs> and uh, make sure that I did not miss it so it'd be like a bright yellow one right in front of me and I'd make sure that I got those three things nailed every single day and it's it, it's, be, uh, it's creating good habits and mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. it's something that I, I still don't see enough people talking about is like 
the health side of and like the 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 effects of our job in terms of our body like for example we sit for a long periods of time and there's a reason why um like obviously i grew up in sport so obviously uh, it's uh, maybe it's a wee bit easier for me to enjoy sport but like i love mm-hmm. going to the gym and it's it's literally like if i'm not at the gym I, like i'm just going crazy i'm like oh my god well, <laughs> well <laughs> i don't know what to do now like, but it's mm-hmm. it's these things go such a long way and it's all about your mental health and looking after yourself so thanks for diving into that because obviously covid's um affecting everyone in uh others more than other how you know what i mean it, <laughs> people, i couldn't speak there for a second I could, I was like, oh, well, i'm trying to think of a phrase here I'm trying to make it make sense <laughs> do you think after mm, yeah, one podcast yeah. i'd be smooth <laughs> <laughs> what's well, hard with like two hours to make sure you're perfectly consistent yeah. oh yeah <laughs> um yeah no but i guess yeah of course you know everybody's everybody's different in how they'll you know uh respond and react to things like um so i have two older brothers mm-hmm. um and one of them so i'm the youngest and my middle brother, I, I found it kind of really interesting growing up. This is this is a tangent, but like this guy is, it's insane. So he was he was eight years old, mm-hmm. and he was like, uh, it was like he was in the military because every night before school he would perfectly fold his clothes so that when he woke up he knew exactly where everything was all the time. He's always been that kind of person, you know. It's it's just been I think natural for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was like. You know, I, maybe I shouldn't mention this, but I, I had this great idea when I was about nine or ten that if I slept in my clothes, I wouldn't have to put them on <laughs> the next morning. The like, I was place. that kind of person. I was like, oh, if I just sleep in my jeans and my shirt, like, I don't even need to bother putting anything on. I can just jump out and not take a shower and just go to school. I, I think my parents put a stop to that pretty quick once they found yeah. out what was happening. But it's it's funny looking at things like that because, yeah, I mean, long way to say that people are different but people are you know people just the way that people operate and function is very different so yeah certain things like when you were talking about how you know how you kind of get a bit antsy if you don't go to the gym mm-hmm. i'm kind of the odd that's actually something i struggle with a lot um i was always a pretty i was always a pretty healthy kid you know mm-hmm. i'd always run around as you know pretty pretty fit pretty skinny and i never had to of course work at staying in shape so it's okay. actually been something I've been struggling with as I've been getting a bit older is so I used to skateboard a bunch. I was, oh, I was like awesome. super into skateboarding. I just loved it. I never liked uh, team sports as much. Team sports always felt a bit too rigid for me, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I loved skateboarding because it was this cool mix of a physical sport, but also, you know, it was totally your sort of own thing. If you wanted to go out and learn a trick or if you wanted to try something weird, like, you know, try something creative, you could do that. And I always appreciated that. So I've I've gotten out of skateboarding recently, and I've also found it really hard to do that, to push myself to go out for runs or to go to the gym, or I've been kind of struggling with doing calisthenics recently. I'll kind of have two weeks where I'm on it and I'm doing some push-ups and sit-ups. So yep. I bought myself a pull-up bar, so I've been doing a bit of that. But then I'll always have these struggles where I, I try it and I try to build the habits, but it's one of these things which you know, I guess life's a little bit unfair sometimes because I think it's like it takes a, a, like a month to build a habit. Yep. It takes like two days to break it. Do you hear, you know, you probably tried so, this, but there's one thing, right, that has always worked for me. So mm, I'd love to hear it because <laughs> so, I always, always struggle with that. So yeah. you've, you've probably tried this. So the thing that always helped me, right? So every time that I ever saw anyone new trying to get into sport or trying to get into uh, the gym, the biggest mistake is that they'd always do too much too early. So what mm. I did when I was trying to, when I was completely new to the world of gym, I said in my head, right, I'm only going once every three weeks or once every four weeks. And I did that for the first three months. So I would only go, so in that, in three months, I only went three times, but I made sure that I went. And then after that, I then went twice um, every, um, like every month. And then mm. that became a habit. So I went twice every month. So like I'm not going right. I'm going full in because too too many people th- dive straight in, and then like people always like the one thing I don't believe in is like I don't believe in New New Year's resolutions. I I've never believed in it. I think it's I'm, down. To, I'm <laughs> like, I, like I think it's it's a choice. But in order to make the transition easier, just do it slow. Like bod- your body transformation takes time, and it's there's a lot more to it. Like it's like everyone says it's like ninety percent diet, ten percent uh, actual fitness. 
So when you're trying to make a, a, a change of a habit, it's like for example, I've uh, been going, uh, I've always had struggle with um, my sleeping schedule. So I, I either wake up really, really early, like between like five, five in the morning and six in the morning, or I um, oversleep. And I okay. need, and yeah. I, so, um, but it depends on where I am. So it's, it's a weird one. So the best thing I've ever learned was slowly going into, like slowly get uh, building up. So for you, what I would do is just say, right, this week I'm going skateboarding once and that's it. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter mm-hmm. when it is, just say I'm going skateboarding once and then next week I'm going skateboarding once again and then the week after that I'm just doing once again and then eventually you build it up, then you go to two times and then you build it to three, build it four and then finally you're at five days a week and then you're sorted. Yeah, no, that's that's a that's a great piece of advice for sure. Like it might, it might not I, it might not work for you, but it, give it a shot. It really did help. Well, it's me. funny. I mean, it's it's one of these things where I hear it, and I'm like, oh, that makes so much sense. Mm-hmm. But I still I'm still bad at putting it into practice, and I totally do that thing where I go too hard. I remember um, my dad sent me his friend had a personal trainer, you know, and she had this great calisthenics workout. Mm-hmm. First day, I tried to go through the whole thing. There are these, you know, these squat and lift things where you have a good amount of weight, you do a full squat and then you hyperextend, you know, your arms up. And I did like, I did like uh, 40 of these things. Okay. I couldn't walk for like, yeah, you, you know, couldn't walk, I couldn't walk for like three days afterwards. My thighs were just killing me. So I always, I always make that mistake where I try and push myself too much. So great piece of advice. I wish I could um, uh, be better at be better at following it but yeah, yeah i guess goes, where so i was yeah yeah no i will I'll, I'll keep you updated but well, yeah i guess what i was going to say earlier too is i think maybe a good thing too like what i find is helpful is because it can be i find it can be very brutal uh getting myself to do something that i don't want to do right if mm-hmm. if i if i'm like oh i should really go running and i'm like oh but i don't want to like, run <laughs> try and find something that's good for you so something like skateboarding for me which i've been doing a little bit more recently uh i actually so i kind of got back into it and then i it was too bad my first day getting back into it i landed right on my arm in a bad way and i got a little I... sprain which is some kind of cosmic cosmic bad luck mm-hmm. but i think it's important just to it'll make things like that so much easier if you can find things that you like to do like Completely if you like playing agree. tennis like play tennis you know if you like rock climbing do that i have a friend who's just been super into rock climbing recently mm-hmm. and it's you know it's it's great to see because it's it's not even him like oh i gotta go and work out you know he's just he just loves doing it and if you love going to the gym you know if that's your thing then do that so i guess yeah yeah find something which as far as you know there are there are a million ways to get in shape i guess so you might yeah. as well find one that you actually enjoy doing yeah. Dude, I'm so glad we went down this avenue. I did not expect <laughs> to, to be talking about this. We're totally, we're totally off of uh, art by this point. We're, yeah. we're, no, this is all important. This is all these That's different true. things. That's true. Yeah, no, it is. Uh-huh. It plays such a huge part to your art becoming better. Like your mental health, like releasing endorphins should be a must in your life. Like if you're not mm-hmm. releasing endorphins, folks, like you need to be um, just having a break, doing anything just to chill. It, it literally changes everything for you. Right. We've talked about the the journey we've talked about the <laughs> the rookies we've talked about health we've talked about think tank now it's time to talk about arrows <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. the show is just starting <laughs> <laughs> right so, tell us a wee bit about to the to the viewers who have not seen it they'll obviously see it now mm. on screen what made mm. you want to make this right. incredible piece it was it was a whole bunch of things. I mean, it really comes down to just the amazing concept by by Klaus Klaus Pilon. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know he's French, so I hope I'm not. I'm probably messing up his last name too. But Klaus, if you ever listen to this, <laughs> thank you again for the for the amazing concept. Because I just you know I was looking through concepts, and I'm I'm really into a lot of like darker fantasy stuff. Like I love dark, dreary ruins and and foreboding things, and I'm really into that stuff too. Uh, so I was looking at a whole bunch of different stuff. I was looking at maybe like a Western idea for a scene for my demo reel. Oh, interesting. Uh, I found this really cool kind of uh, Western concept of this old mine shaft kind of turned gang hideout. And I was, oh, this is really cool too. So I had all these different avenues, but nothing really quite like hit me. You know, I was still kind of juggling some ideas. Mm-hmm. And I think I was just on ArtStation, you know, looking for concepts. And I was using Pinterest more for concept searching because I think that's gives you some more similar results. So I was like, I don't even know why I'm on ArtStation. I probably won't find anything fitting. 
And then it was like this bright, shining light kind of moment where I saw his concept oh. pop up. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was like, holy hell, this is the coolest thing ever. And we can touch upon, well, maybe I'll say this right now. I think one thing which I really loved about the concept, mm -hmm. which I don't think is actually, you know, I, I feel like the idea of a tree city, it's not the most, it's not the most original idea, right? It's been done, the Ewok village and, you know, uh, the elves in Lord of the Rings, I forget their, their city, their oh, city's um, name. But, yeah. um, oh, um, gosh, I'm going to get hate for now. I should know this. Yeah, we're both going to get... We're both Wait, gonna get we can edit this. Ha oh, the power yeah. of... <laughs> <laughs> They'll uh, never know. Th th Thrand <laughs> Thranduil's... What's it called? It is called... Oh, Ed, here. This is this is brilliant because I'm not going to edit out. They're just going to hear like, their, their, their country and their plans. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is it called? To the Google search we go. Wait, what is it called? This is go I'm going to go... You're going to... I can Google, I can Google search it here because oh, I, I had it in my mind the other day, but... um. What is it right. called? It is called something. It is called something. See, I know that much, people. It is called something. Oh, Lothlorien. There oh, we go. Oh, wait, I was thinking... Oh, right, okay, okay. I was thinking of mm -hmm. the one in The Hobbit. Okay, sorry. Yes, Lothlorien's oh, a great okay. place. Yeah, yeah. So, But I feel like they fall into two camps. So there's Ewok Village, which is... The thing looks rickety, and it looks like it's going to fall apart like at any moment. You know, like uh, the boards are not even... You know, it's got this very kind of chaotic, primal look to it, which is very cool. But I feel like that's being sort of played out. And then there's the Lothlorien look where it's like there's this beautiful synergy between the architecture and the trees. Mm -hmm. And everything is kind of, yeah, it's like a symbiotic relationship almost between the elves and the forest, which is also very cool, but it doesn't feel super original. So what I really loved about this concept by Klaus is that there is this kind of interesting conflict between some steampunk elements and the architecture colliding against the more organic shapes. And it didn't, it felt very original compared to those two camps, which I feel like I usually see with the tree city. Mm -hmm. So I, cause I was kind of thinking about it and I was like, why am I so drawn to this concept? And I kind of stumbled upon that where there's this great contrast or conflict between the inorganic and the organic. So I think that's partly what drew it, drew me to it. Just aside from there's there's so many cool things in that. There's so many cool little touches. There's the elevator. There's the background work, which is amazing. So I, as soon as I saw it, I was like, I would love to do this. But then it became a question of, can I actually do it? Because it's it's a bit. It was a bit crazy. I remember talking to some people, and they were like, "Are you like insane? Like, no, nah, man, do a room. <laughs> you know, do <laughs> do a room. You don't need to worry about backgrounds. You don't need to worry about exteriors. You can just focus on materials and props and you know, do something simple. This is going to, you know, I think people were a bit worried when I said that I wanted to take it on. They're like, this is going to fall on its face. Well, you know, I think people had this idea where they're like, it's it's maybe just a bit too much to do and, and still make look good. Because I think that's a decent point where it's, if you're trying to do too many things within a certain time frame and a project and you're not devoting your resources into maybe things which are more important and more necessary, there is a good chance that every the whole quality of the whole thing is going to suffer from that. Mm -hmm. You know, so I kind of heard that feedback a good amount, and I think it was valuable feedback, but part of me was like, nah, like, screw that. <laughs> I just, I just want to make this thing. Like, I really do. So, yeah. So, because that was... Uh, here, this is this is playing it brilliantly. I'm loving it. Because my, <laughs> my next question was uh, intimidation. So, mm. we... So I'm on your side on this one, right? Because I got mm. asked the same question. No, I got told the same thing when I made my train station. So I, oh, okay, I, I yeah. made I made this train station uh, for my piece. It was the piece that helped me get into the industry. And the first thing I was told was, "Are you sure?" <laughs> and in my said, I was like, "Hell yeah! Have you have you seen the image? The con <laughs> the concept art is like literally to die for to make. Like I was just craving it's modeling amazing. Yeah. and." when you have that actual connection with a piece you're going to get the job done well i know it's um like i know obviously it takes like lots of work to put in like i know you you spent seven months working on yours but you were seven mm -hmm. months committed you you were figuring lots of different things out like think about how much you improved right since your first semester at think tank your first piece like your th first piece was still really good and just think how Thanks. much you skyrocketed to like, your next piece because mm -hmm, when mm -hmm. I when I think about art, right, 
the biggest mistake so many people make is that they choose a piece based on either somebody else has told them to do it and they've forgotten about why they do art in the first place. I was talking to, so when I was, so I was fortunate and I was really glad, uh, like I was blessed to be invited. So Ryan Kingsley invited me to go on his podcast and I was talking to him about why, like, why do we art, why do we do art? Like, Every, everyone always thinks about getting a job but they forget about the, the enjoyment aspects sometimes like i do art because i love art i don't do art for anyone else i don't care i do art because i want to make art and choosing a piece that you're passionate about that you just geek out about like you're you're full on elrond geeking out lord of the rings <laughs> beast mode fantasy legendary awesomeness I have no idea what I'm saying, but you get the picture. It <laughs> feels it feels great. So that that means you're gonna do it because mm-hmm. you, and, mm-hmm. and, that, and that's the feeling that I think is super important. Yes, I get it. Sometimes maybe a reality check has to be put in place. Like maybe if it's like your first piece. Like imagine you did that as your first piece. Then whew, that, that that would be yeah, a bit, that would be that, yeah. That would be that would be a tough one to uh, that would uh-huh. be a tough one to to figure out that that would be like a year's project for me if i was doing that on my first mm, pro- mm-hmm, my first project mm-hmm. and you could tell that you enjoyed it and all the the story aspects um uh the whole background story for iro himself and the not only did you obviously capture the concept you also added your own flair to it so mm. you found a way to be creative and that in itself like that's all that's all people are looking for like um, like you, you were able to capture, like I said earlier, the ability that people wanted to be there. Like one thing I really like about your piece is it's so easy to look at, and that was something I struggled with for many years. Was having something that was easy on the eyes. Like I always tended to make things a wee bit too overcomplicated, too noisy, oh, okay. and it would be. Like obviously, I still appreciate composition, and uh, I I felt I had a good understanding of it, but there was still maybe a bit too much on. But when I was looking at your piece, uh, Alwyn said the same thing. Like it's the atmosphere, it's the immersive environment, it's the way you lit things, everything. Like you've not gone too insane with the texturing. It's just it's all well balanced, and that's one of the things I think that really made your artwork stand out. So going back to what you were saying earlier, why did you get chosen? That's 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 just some of the reasons why I think you won the rookies. <laughs> so yeah. Thanks, thanks, thanks so much, man. That's that's great to hear, because I, I you know I said maybe we could touch on it a little bit more, and yeah, the way I looked at my project was that like to be honest, I thought my favorite thing from doing uh, the bookstore and my kind of what I feel like I did best was that maybe sort of idea of of embellishing the concept. Mm-hmm. And adding a little bit of that extra spin and extra character, and it was, it was kind of funny because I remember when I was gathering reference, I was like, I feel like this needs, I I love the concept, right? But I just feel like it needs a little bit more to, to anchor it. And I think I just watched Avatar: The Last Airbender, really late. I never watched it as a kid. <laughs> Woo! But um, <laughs> I remember guys... I was watching it. I was watching it while I was at Think Tank because I think I was talking to a friend from school, you know, and they're like. You know, they're like, oh, man, you got to watch Avatar The Last Airbender. One of the best shows of all time. It's amazing. Uh, and I had a terrible experience with it when I was younger because I had an old friend who came over to visit. And he's like, oh, my God, Avatar The Last Airbender movie's out. Like, we got to watch it. You know, oh. the one done by M. Night Shyamalan. And I was like, I don't know, man. Isn't this kind of like a kind of like a kid's thing? He's, no, it's going to be great. You're going to love it. And I remember we watched the movie and both of us were just like, we just we just sat there in silence for like 10 minutes after. Like, we didn't even have words. We were like let's just forget this happened <laughs> but, but so I had, a, I had a bad experience with um after so then you know but a, a friend convinced me to watch the show mm-hmm. and i watched it and i was like this show was amazing and of course iroh's by far my favorite character from the show and so iroh's bookstore it, it was kind of weird because i didn't want to make it attached to that world mm-hmm. or i didn't want to make it actually like iroh is that character i just loved the name and I thought maybe some subtle homages to it. It was maybe a bit too on the nose because I actually, and this was cool too. Usually, um, usually I'll post my own work to to Reddit. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, there's a there's a whole uh, a group of subreddits called the imaginary kind of subreddits where it's like imaginary characters and imaginary landscapes. And I'd really recommend them to anybody if you're on Reddit and you're looking for inspiration because there's some really good work on there. 
but so typically I'd post my own digital paintings and stuff on there and stuff. But I was just browsing one day and I saw that somebody put my put my scene up. And for me, that was kind of really cool. That like I wasn't almost promoting myself, but somebody else saw it and put it up. Um, but awesome. it was funny because all of all of the comments were like, "Ah oh, man, like where's the pie show table?" You know, and oh man, like Iro, he'd have a tea store. Like why does he have a bookstore? And so I realized that maybe some of my little little homages and Easter eggs were like a bit too on the nose. Mm-hmm. Oh, anyways, that's a bit of a, a bit of a tangent. But uh, going back to reference gathering and stuff. Um, so I kind of felt like it needed a character, and I'd just seen Avatar, and I loved Iroh, and I was like, like, and I was thinking about the kind of character that would own this bookstore. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know, definitely an Iroh-like figure, a centered, zen, calm, wise, older character. So I started to kind of get all of these props, and I got some really wacky sort of ideas, which I'm really happy. Like, I had this idea where I was like, you know, what, what would you do if you lived in this, like, massive uh, forest? And I was like probably a lot of birds like i feel like he'd probably get into bird watching <laughs> you know so i so i put in all these little details where like his notebook has these bird sketches on it and he has he has the binoculars oh, you know it's a, it's a for nice for seeing it and all these little beats and i really wanted to add in a bird feeder mm-hmm. but i couldn't i couldn't quite find a right place for it and stuff so that one didn't make it in but so i i started to really geek out about this which was funny because somebody would come to go and check up on my project and be like oh how's like the block out coming and i'd be like Oh, like it doesn't look very good. Like, never mind that. But like, look at this. And I'd show them my PRF board, and I'd do this. And it was really, I don't, I think everybody thought I was like losing my mind because I would show them the PRF board and the props, and I would ask them to like tell me the character that they visualized or that they envisioned when I showed them just the different props. You know, the cane, the notebook, the satchel, the um, the binoculars, and so. I don't know. I, that was a really fun process for me is just developing this character by like, yeah, what would his day to day life be like? So I almost thought about it not as much as, you know, people talk about a lot of storytelling mm-hmm. and, and uh, you know, environmental storytelling. And I mean, it's, it's still kind of partly that. But for me, almost with that whole patio area, I almost thought it was more like uh, like character building or like, you know. Yeah, yeah, sort of building this character with what he sort of surrounds himself with and with the painting and stuff like that, you know, that was also something that he'd do in his um, spare time. So that was sort of, that was my favorite part of the project. And what I did too is I saved my, I saved that whole patio area, all of those props. They're just about the last thing that I did in the project. Oh, really? Right, okay. So it was kind of like the, it was kind of like the cherry on top. Like everything I was doing was working to doing those props. And it started, it kind of, I built it up that way. So I did, when I started getting to those props, it was just, again, I was kind of like on cloud nine. <laughs> I was just really, really enjoying myself. Dude, that is, oh, I'm, I'm so happy. Like any, any time Iroh is mentioned, uh, I've had my fair shares of 20 minute discussions about geeking out about uh, Avatar. Uh, oh, it was so good uh, growing up. Uh, mm-hmm. I watched it um, again, the full rerun, I think last year. I always like to stretch stretch out though. I like to make sure that I don't watch it too much because it is it's literally my childhood. It was so good. Uh, I could literally mm, talk about mm-hmm. it for days. So when you were saying, <laughs> like, I I was going to ask you, and I was glad you just started geeking out about it because I was like, because I I'm not sure if you guys noticed everyone listening because uh, Robert went yeah because I I raised my hands when he <laughs> I started raising my hands up in the air and started geeking out when he mentioned Iro from the Avatar. I was like hell yeah, let's go. <laughs> it's, it's so cool. Um, so obviously we've dived into a lot of different topics today but there's a lot of other things that I really wanted to kind of touch on before we get to the final crazy section of the podcast that's right folks we've got question time coming up more questions <laughs> non-stop bombardment we really have to come up with a unique name for this because question time I was saying at the start to Robert it's not the most unique the, the unique uh, title so to speak so if anyone has any suggestions, please put it in the comments down below on YouTube. It'd be much appreciated because I can. Um, oh, I'll <laughs> start. Go... I'll start brainstorm. I'll I'll start brainstorming some on my on my free time too. It'd be cool to have like a little, you know, when you say question time, there's like an air horn that comes in and dun, dun, dun. some clapping and cheering or some crazy electronic music or something, you know, just to build oh. build up the intensity. Since you said that, I'm gonna do that now. It's gonna be did it did it. I just had like a weird. <laughs> I just like. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking take about. It, take it like a in like a game show direction. Yeah. Oh, here, dude. <laughs> I, that's here. That's my goal, man. I will have my own show. 
I, mm. this is my own this is my this is my obviously my first ever main podcast and i love doing it but stay tuned folks there's going to be many more content to come but with that said <laughs> let's continue talking about arrows bookstore because that's why you guys are all here and we know why uh so um one thing i wanted to ask you is making a scene look beautiful versus something for production so i know um and i did the same thing as well and i know a lot of people do this but what's your thoughts on aiming for something that's aesthetically pleasing and not necessarily stressing all the time about being like perfectionist on the production side of things like what's what's your thoughts like having a healthy balance between production work and beauty work yeah i think that's a really interesting question and i I think a lot of it comes down to just um I guess what you're hoping to get out of a project, mm-hmm. a demo reel is weird because, you know, a demo reel, that's what you're going to be sending to studios to get hired. I think I heard a really interesting piece of advice right as I was starting my demo reel. I think it was from one of my teachers who said, this is one of the last times you're going to be able to dedicate seven months to a personal project, you know, to work full time on your own thing. It's unless you basically take like a, a sabbatical vacation and you just do your own thing right like that's not going to come about so i kind of heard that and i was like oh shit yeah like i really want to make sure that what i'm doing is something that i'm incredibly passionate about and it's, yeah. it's something more than just a something to get hired you know it's, it's something that's really like you said it's it's art for me yeah that i will be showing to people but really at the end of the day it's it's for my own sort of what i'm getting out of it do you do you so the way I see it, right? And this is uh, like literally disagree with me if you if you if you mm. want to disagree. There's no, no harm in that. So the way I think portfolios is should be displayed best is that you have your main piece, right, that defines you, like your piece that is you. So for example, you've got Iro, and then like I know obviously you've got your job through that, which is great. So if you get hired from one piece, awesome, happy days. Same thing happened to me, and it's mm. a great it's a great feeling, but. I always think it's also good to have. So if you say you have one beauty, one beauty piece or a piece that's really strong, and then the other piece is just a prop, and it simply showcases that you have the pipeline in place. I think that's an important thing to show. Um, it's getting that health, healthy balance between the two. But I completely agree with you. I think when you're committing so much time, um, especially like five to seven months, it's a lot of time to commit. You want to be enjoying it. And you want mm-hmm. to put the most effort as you possibly can, and you don't want to have to necessarily have to stress about about everything having to be OCD perfect all the time. All oh, this this trim sheet uh, trim sheet isn't looking quite perfect. I don't know. There's lots of ways you can disguise things in the industry, which is great, and it's something that you should actually be really happy about. It's uh, you don't always have to be perfect. So when it comes to being perfect, enjoy it in the actual beauty of the art side of things. So I'm glad you said that. So mm-hmm. when it comes to um, so I've got a few more pod, uh, questions I want to ask and there was something that you said which I was really happy uh, about because I'm a big fan of reading so you said on your 80 level article um, that uh, you have a big fa- um, like you like fantasy, you like movies etc and you were talking about reading as well. How has reading helped you as as a creative because when I read the, be- the the reason why I love reading in the first place, and I'm pretty sure lots of uh, people who read do do this, um, like the reason why they love it is simply because it's your ability to imagine and creating mm-hmm. your own ideas. Like how has that helped you with your, your own art, your, your art journey? That's a really, yeah. Yeah. That's a really uh, interesting question. And I know we're maybe we're getting a bit short on time, but I also wanted to touch a little bit more on that last question. Yeah. Here. Just so I didn't. Uh, all be, the time I'll in the quick. world. Take your time. Right, okay. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, I, I wanted to make it, I wanted to make something I was really passionate about, but that's not, that's not to say that I just threw out all sort of optimization and proper workflows and techniques out the window. Those are still important, but I think another good uh, piece of advice I heard in regards to that was don't go out of your way to, to make a, to make a trim sheet or something, right? Like in basically every environment, that stuff's going to come up. Right? Mm-hmm. There's going to be a perfect place for tiling textures. There's going to be a perfect place for, for blend mats and vert painting. And don't stress about that stuff too much. It'll come up in a natural way as, as you need it. And it's important to show those different skills off. Mm-hmm. But I think, it's, I think it's a mix. And I think 
I, I guess, you know, for me, um, I suppose it did work out creating a primarily art focused reel compared to a primarily tech focused reel. I still had, you know, the, you know, the tech and the techniques in there, but I think a reason that people responded to it well was the, um, yeah, was that, was that kind of big focus on, on art and just creating a kind of world and that whole idea of, I guess, you know, uh, an environment which is, which is some of its parts. So I think if you really took my environment apart and you looked at specific things, there's nothing crazy going on, but the way it comes together, I think it it, it has a cohesion to it. It's the execution, but, like you mm-hmm, executed it. Mm-hmm. You, I think you, like I well, I I don't think I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know you you made like the final result. Like at the end of the day, that's what we're all looking for. Like it's the final result, as and it, as long as it looks great, perfect, happy days. Yes, we can all talk about being as efficient as possible, but once again, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. You're wanting to enjoy what you're doing like if this is a portfolio piece that you're making to get in, in the job like you want to enjoy it because if you're not going to enjoy it you're, you're not going to finish it and mm-hmm. like you said it's, uh, earlier on if you're committing to something for seven months like, if you're in, if you're not enjoying that bad poof, you're, you're setting yourself up for a difficult time i'll tell you that yeah no for sure yeah so i, I yeah i think what it really comes down to is wanting to and it's subjective for everybody but create create pieces and create art that you connect with emotionally and hopefully other people will also have that that connection and that response to awesome so mm-hmm. anyways no, <laughs> i okay. just wanted to touch on that because i didn't want to kind of i felt like i gave off this impression where it's like nah don't worry about any of that any of that silly tech stuff just you know, <laughs> it's, it's important but i i don't think you should let it override um, no i understand the, the Dude, fundamental sort of art of the scene for sure mm-hmm Amazing, amazing. Right. <laughs> um, no, th- thanks. I appreciate it. There's, there's no rush whatsoever, so take your time, dude. Um, mm, I, 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 like I said, here, if you get trapped talking to me, oh, you're gonna be here for a long time, dude. <laughs> <laughs> we have another, we have another four hours ahead of us. Here, <laughs> Balaj, if you're still listening to this, he understands. If he, if he, if he mentions World of Warcraft or Sauron, the, the conversation is going to continue. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So I wanted to ask you this before we get into uh, question time because I found it interesting because, like I said, I have a passion for reading, and I think I'm not. I wouldn't say reading's slowly fading away, but because obviously there's still massive people, like millions and millions or billions worldwide, still reading a lot. But I don't see a lot of artists reading these days. Um, mm-hmm. You may mm-hmm. you might disagree with me, but what's your thoughts on on reading? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's it's one of these funny things where I would say it's incredibly valuable and, and incredibly important too. At the same time, I almost feel like a bit of a hypocrite because I don't read nearly as much <laughs> as I should. It's, it's, it's a hard thing for me. And I think for me, it's kind of, I spent a summer uh, away from home. I was up in, so uh, Vancouver, you know, BC, Canada, uh, people might recognize the name, but it, it's a short drive away from a mountain called Whistler. It's kind oh, of right. a mountain nice. resort town. So I had a friend who, um, his parents own a cabin up there for, so for one summer, we just, and this is kind of right after high school, I was still figuring out what I wanted to do. Uh, so I, you know, went up with my friend and just stayed in the, in this cabin for about three months. And he had no internet there, Oh, <laughs> which was like the greatest thing for me. It was yeah. awesome. I read so much. I basically, you know, aside from, I worked a couple jobs up there. Uh, and I just kind of, you know, did my thing and I go out to the lake and, you know, but almost uh, most of my time in a way was just spent reading. I just, I read a huge amount. I read all the way through the Lord of the Rings. Um, there's a, there's an author named Herman Hess, who I really like. He's mm-hmm. an old German author. He, you know, wrote, um, Steppenwolf and Siddhartha and these really great books, which kind of incorporate Eastern, uh, philosophies in a more Western approach. So I really loved reading through those. Uh, I think I read a couple couple sci-fi's. I really need to read some of those more great sci-fi books, like Foundation and the and the Dune series and stuff. Oh, I still but, need I still need to read that. I've been told so much about it. It's it's hard, man. There's so many there are so many things to to read, right? I also so I have two older brothers, and they're bigger readers than me, and they've been telling me I need to read the kind of the great Russian authors, you know, Dostoevsky, and you know, so there's so much stuff to read. And maybe that's another kind of problem is it can be a bit overwhelming. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think reading is like, it's, it's really important, a for just just inspiring you, but also, yeah, reading things, which 
it, it helps you almost find ideas that you connect with yeah um completely. and and find what's valuable and maybe that's getting you know but it can also inform your art and what you're creating i remember reading siddhartha which is a really short book but it's just chock full of amazing ideas at least for me i connected so much when well, reading that book that's that's the thing at the day it's when i read so i read lots of dystopian based uh, novels mm. etc and <laughs> that's my favorite genre to go into and being able to have like a, just a notepad beside you trying to visualize what it could be and then translating that over to your world it because you're obviously you're you're putting all your passions together that you've built almost like a library in your brain over the years of all the things um i don't know from i don't know passions from star wars vehicles so like when i'm when there's like a vehicle scene or something something for, that i've remembered in uh, that's at the back of my head will just come into play when i'm reading this scene and it's just awesome how you can start to build a really nice picture around it and mm -hmm. i've always felt felt that reading is such a, an important aspect to life my dad always used to say to me all the time make sure you're uh, reading read all the time or read as much as you can like my main thing at the moment is business so i've been studying business like crazy i'm, I'm craving it like i'm, I'm obsessed <laughs> with it i'm addicted with it man it's brilliant i love it but no th thanks for answering that because i haven't i haven't really got to chat the chance to talk much about reading and uh, i really hope people who are listening are getting their hours uh, worth of reading um mm -hmm. so we could be talking for days but um, <laughs> yeah. we, dude i have to have you back on the podcast man i would love that it's uh, been it's been great man it's been a lot of fun we're gonna have to do a round two because I'm... there's so much more we could talk about but yeah yeah uh -huh. so it is time folks do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> it's question time right <laughs> Time to be bombarded with the most randomest questions of all time. I hope all you right. enjoy it because I love <laughs> this ready. part. So, <laughs> favorite TV show and why? Ooh, um, I don't know if you if you've heard about it. It's a show called The Leftovers. Oh, I've not heard of this. Wait, what's this? It's uh, I think it's an HBO show. Mm -hmm. It's. I think it's absolutely incredible. I think it's quite underrated. I think uh, not leftovers. many people know about it. It's called The Leftovers. It sounds like a funny name for a show. It's not a cooking show. I, I, I promise you that. <laughs> um, basically, the, the pitch is that it's something like just out of nowhere, out of the blue, one day, it's like 3% of the world's population. Maybe it's 4%, but it's not a huge percentage, but they just vanish. They're just gone into thin air. And it's basically... It's this really interesting show where it's not. I don't. And I don't want to. I don't really want to spoil too much. But I'd say that the show isn't exactly so focused on explaining this mystery of what happened to these people, but it more ex explores, like what happens to our society and how we view God and how we view science and all these things when this sort of just random catastrophe happens. You know, uh, scientists have no answers. You know, um, you know. The Vatican and priests and spiritual leaders have no answers. Nobody knows what happens, mm -hmm. and it's it's this really interesting show which just explores this, just how that affects people and how it affects their personal lives. And I think it's I think it's a fantastic show. The soundtrack, the the OST for it is amazing. Never heard of it. <laughs> right, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I've got something to to look forward to. I've been. Um... Well, well, actually, no, I better not say because it's actually part of the last question. I don't want to spoil the, mm, the, the, mm. the, the famous creme de la creme question. I can't ruin that. <laughs> so, uh, no, interesting answer. I did not, no, nobody sent, said that one yet. So uh, I see where you're coming from. It's uh, of your saying it's a wee bit underrated. I'm going to have to check it out. So thanks for that. The mm -hmm, leftover mm -hmm. some, something new. I'm liking it. I'll, I can, I'll, send you, I'll send you a trailer for it so you don't, oh, so you don't forget. Please, yeah. <laughs> please do. Right, mm. next one. Would you rather speak every language or be the best in the world at one thing oh that's 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 a good question it's a toughie this, this is the great that's thing about me one. asking them <laughs> yeah yeah to be honest i might do the language thing oh yeah. because oh, nice because I, I one thing and i this is i've kind of it's a bit of a shame for me because um so my mom is german she was awesome. a first generation German immigrant, so speaks fluent German. Mm -hmm. My dad is Canadian, but he's a fluent French speaker. Mm -hmm. And I, I love my parents, but I'm a little bit, I'm a bit upset that they never taught me 
yeah. either language. I only speak English. Okay. And I never really thought about it, but I've, I've heard some ideas related to language where you can actually rewire the way that you think based on the language that you know. Whoa. Because really? based on grammar and the way that languages are structured, I guess it depends on how you think, but I'm, I'm, um, you know, you can be more of a visual thinker or you can be, uh, more of a, a spoken thinker. Mm -hmm. You know, like for me, I'm, I, I still think, you know, if I'm thinking, oh, I need to go and pick up milk or eggs on the way home. I, I think that, you know, as a, as a sentence or whatever. Um, but I've heard this idea that learning different languages actually can like rewire your brain and the way you think, because in Japanese, that whole sentence and the way that works is different from English. That's incredible. So if I if I spoke every language in the world, be a it's almost like I could think in every in every different way, which I think would be fascinating. Yeah. I also think being the best at something in the world honestly might be a bit overrated. You know, if I'm probably in the top five percent. Mm -hmm. Like I'm good. <laughs> I think if I was the very best at something, I I think I'd become quite like uh, jealous. Okay. Or I'd always become you know if I was at the top of the mountain, I'd always be like looking down and being like oh you know all everybody else who's right up there uh, you know at the top with me or is climbing up i think it would create this thing where if i was really if i really cared about it mm -hmm. that i was the best at this thing then i think it would almost have a negative effect on me where i would almost be like yeah you know, i don't know trying to hold on to my treasure <laughs> or something Good answer. you know no, i know what you're coming from i know uh -huh. i know what you mean um yeah because uh, it's always nice to have something to to strive towards like every time i'm always on the hunt for these questions Trust me, it's always difficult choosing them. It's, about, <laughs> it's always a good laugh. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was you... a good question, man. I like that a lot. Yeah. I've never asked that one. I have to use that one I more. Think, well, it's cool, these questions, because it's like things that you never think about. Mm -hmm. like, I never, I never, you know, thought about that at all. That... I've thought about learning languages as being cool, but put it, putting it down to that way, then, yeah. It's, it's, well, that's why I do this section. It's always a good laugh. It's something completely different. It's, uh, it really makes you think. And, it, and actually, I think it's, to be honest, right, do you know every time a junior comes on the show... I think it's great practice because imagine somebody threw a random question in the interview. You obviously, you couldn't expect it, but maybe this is a good way to t test it out for you. <laughs> that's how I've been. That's how I've been treading this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> it's all prep work. No, no. All prep but, work. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's all right. Right. <laughs> Would you rather have your dream car or have a personal helicopter? Ooh. I know which one I'm going, but I'm not going to say my answer. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, no, actually, we should be doing this back and forth. So I'd like to know how you feel about the best at one thing and the language thing. But we can deal with this one first. I oh. think, I don't know. I'm going helicopter. You're going helicopter? I think I'm going car. Because Ooh, I think right. I think a, a, the problem with a helicopter is, A, I'd need to learn how to, how to unless I had a personal helicopter, like, chauffeur. Yeah, like, actually, actually, like let's, go guy. With that. let's go with that. You have a personal let's go chauffeur. With that. You have a personal chauffeur. That might be easier because I think I'd be pretty stressed driving a. Well, we'll say I don't know. I think I'd be kind of stressed driving a helicopter. There's a lot of yeah. I've seen those cockpits. There's a lot of moving <laughs> parts. But I think maybe I think maybe car. I'm not even a big car guy. But um, another problem I think that I have with helicopters is that you need to you need to have like a you know helipads mm -hmm. to land. So I almost feel like it might be more of a bother than it's worth. I think I might prefer the car thing. And I, it's weird. I'm not a car guy, but there's something that I love about old school American muscle yep. cars, oh, dude, like an yes, old Pontiac dude. Firebird or like an old uh, old Mustang. Like yes, Mustang. Those cars Mustang. are just they're just cool, man. I think it's probably pop culture. I think it's probably old movies that I've mm -hmm. seen where it's always the protagonist driving around. The GTs. In some sweet, yeah, yeah, sweet Mustang or something. But so I think I, I think I'd go with car. Oh, dude, you've made me switch almost. Now. <laughs> Like, the, the first, I don't mean to sway you too much, but the, the first time I ever watched Fast and Furious, uh, and and the his car just comes out, you're just like, oh boy, it's kicking off, folks. <laughs> <laughs> oh right, okay, I, I'll answer that one. So I no, actually, oh the book no. one, yeah. Oh wait, the 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 first one. Uh, so, yeah, because I don't think you answered that. Yeah. Oh right, okay. Now I'm getting you at this spot. <laughs> <laughs> so, would I rather speak every language or be the best? in the world one category right so one thing that everyone knows in this podcast so i'm a very competitive person however mm. how, but to answer that i think if i was the best it would take away my competitive fun so because i oh, okay. i yeah. i yeah. crave the competitive aspect so when someone's like right it's go time and then it's like oh here we go <laughs> <laughs> that's just me in a nutshell I was like when, it, when it's sports like uh, the best thing ever, right? 
<laughs> this is just typical me. So say if I'm uh, any sport, I can't believe I'm saying this is just, well, I'm pretty sure every competitive person is like this, but so if I'm swimming, right. Uh, or running or whatever I'm doing, <laughs> I'll be swimming and I'll be like, I'll, I'll just catch their eye when I'm doing like my, uh, the, like my front crawl. And as I'm about to breathe and I just see their face, I'm like, it's go time folks. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's on it, it doesn't matter how old you are if you're like a five-year-old i'm like right let's go you're like you're like the guy that shows up at the stop sign with a nice car that's like blaring it you know ready for a road race except it's just some guy stretching for a jog and you show up and you're like let's do this <laughs> you yeah, trust me that's me in that show when it comes to competing dude he, oh like playing ping pong right i love table tennis like mm. oh well any sport base mainly oh, I, I love it i'm obsessed with it so yeah I would have to go over the language uh, because of the... Just so you can keep competing. Just yeah, so I can keep yeah. competing. <laughs> right. The next well, one. I, I, oh, and okay. Oh, I, had, I, had, I had one stupid little thought about that last one, where if you know every language in the world, mm-hmm. and uh, this is a stupid thing to bring up, but in a way, you're, you're kind of the best at then languages. Oh, <laughs> so hey, come on. Reincorporates. I can't answer any of <laughs> <laughs> Right, the next one. This oh, this one is an interesting one. I I always say that. I say it every, I, that's a habit. I I, I think it's just because I love, I love this one. <laughs> right, would you rather have an underwater lair or a lair on the side of a cliff? Oh, oh, good question. Um, remember, you said that you weren't so keen on heli a helipad, so I'm not sure if you're going to go for the lair on the cliff one. <laughs> mm, yeah, no, that's actually that's a good point. I think I'd still go with the cliff one, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Well, it depends. But when I visualize a, a lair on the side of a cliff, I think of like some sweet Icelandic cliff, you know, oh, overgrown yes, moss and fog. And I like that visual more than an underwater lair. Dude. I'd probably, maybe, maybe I'm a bit too analytical about this too, but I feel like an underwater lair, like the upkeep would be a nightmare. Yeah, <laughs> you know the the amount of work that you'd have to do to make sure that you know everything's working fine. You don't have leaks, and I think I'd get tired of that. Whereas I think if I was just on the side of a cliff, like I think that's I think that's my answer. <laughs> I you, think that'd be easier. I don't know. I I, th- I think I want to say I'm going to agree with you on that one. That's a good one. <laughs> right. The next one is going to be the I think the most conflict. If anyone reacts in the comments, I'm I'm intrigued to what everyone's has on this one. Jason Bourne or John Wick? Ooh, John Wick for me, man, definitely. Oh, okay, hands, okay, hands down, John Wick. I'm a He's... Jason. I'm good, Jason Bourne. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is going to be interesting. <laughs> we're com- we're conflicting like crazy right now. We're gonna have to dissect this one like twenty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but okay. I'll, I'll I think accept- I think John Wick, man. Maybe it's partly just my emotional reaction to John Wick. I, I watched I watched maybe the first two mm-hmm. uh, Jason Bourne movies when I was a kid, but I, there's something about John Wick where it's like. In a way, he's got more personal. He's got more personal stakes in it. I don't know. You just you just see Keanu Reeves as John Wick, and he's got this he's got this conviction mm-hmm. in his eyes. You know, you won't stop. <laughs> oh, amazing! You love to see it. Um, okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll I'm not going to argue that one because I know there's going to be a lot of people saying John Wick on this one because uh, I have my say, but I I, I don't know. <laughs> um, mm. Right. So we've got four more questions. Um, mm. transform into animals or be able to go through any object definitely uh, definitely transform into animals you're definitely going in the animals theme today I see it yeah I think I mean it, do you need to pick one animal or could it be like any animal you any... can literally go into anything yeah yeah I think man, it's more cooler be being animals I in, my, in my D&D game I'm playing a druid right now so <laughs> it kind of <laughs> makes sense you I'm, I'm super into plans. that idea of just being able to transform into different wild shapes and switch from an eagle into a bear to you know a ferret. Yeah, oh, you've <laughs> that got sounds it. good to me. Yeah, <laughs> amazing, amazing. Because uh, the, the only the only thing right I saw on the YouTube channels when I was checking, would you rather was people be like, it's easier job to get to work if you could go through anything. <laughs> You could just run yeah. directly in one path. That was the only main outcome. Oh, it's true. But I feel like even then, right, you could just, like, turn into a, some fast bird, a big eagle or oh, something, yes, right? Or like an creature. osprey, okay. and then you're just you're just good, right? You just yeah. transform once you get there. I never thought this through. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Would you rather be thrown into a snake pit or be thrown into a spider pit? Ooh. 
what terrifies you more? <laughs> Both suck. <laughs> um... there, there's one thing I want to say about the snakes, but I can't say it because it will ruin one of the best TV shows of all time, and I can't say it now. <laughs> mm, mm. I think... I think probably snakes. I used to be I used to be a real big uh, arachnophobe. Mm -hmm. I'm not as bad now, but I'm basically I'm fine if a spider's around as long as it's not like touching me. But but imagining myself in a pit of like hundreds of tarantulas, I I couldn't. I think I'd prefer uh, snakes would be terrible too. But I think I'd rather go with snakes. Also, right the 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 next uh, the next one. This is going to be impossible for you because I, I had to bring this up because of Avatar. So, mm. would you rather control all the elements or control time? Ooh. Because all the elements would be... You could be earth, you could be fire, you could mm. be all of it, or control time. I think the time ones always makes it really difficult because then you could kind of do anything. <laughs> That's the thing. I feel like time is the more practical one. Yep. Because you could fix any sort of situation. But it's never... I don't know if you ever watched that old TV show, Heroes. Dude, so I've been mini... To watch, so I've been, <laughs> there's so many... This is the hard thing. This is why like when people say TV shows, there's literally so many. So I only started watching Friends, right, this year. And then I mm. found that Friends mm. was, like, my favorite show. Like, anyone who likes <laughs> Friends. Like, Friends and Breaking Bad, my two favorite shows of all time. And it's mm. like, I only mm. got to watch Friends this year because of Netflix had it. I was like, gosh, I've got so many shows to catch up on. <laughs> but uh yeah man i well, as far as this i think i'd go with i think i'd go with all the elements because i feel like time gets messy i have a little bit of a problem with it depends like time travel movies mm-hmm. i find they're good as long as they don't focus too much on the rules of time travel because time travel it's it's a natural paradox it never makes sense and then i find when a movie gets too caught up in trying to explain it it takes I away just, the fun I just, gotta, I just gotta check out my favorite time travel films are like I don't know, something like Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, where they're like, boom, there's time travel, it's a thing, there are no rules, it's whatever we want it to be, let's, like, have fun with it. I've not heard of that film in years. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. That's an old old childhood classic, that one. Gosh, that's years. That's great, man. That film's awesome. I'm only thinking about it recently, because they came out with a new one. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, wait, they came out with a new one? Yeah, yeah, man, it's called uh, Bill and and Ted Face the Music. Oh, my lord, another Uh one. Oh, gosh. (laughs) Yeah. Dude, right, the final question, it's the creme de la creme, I ask, ask this every single guest, mm. favourite cartoon as a kid? That one's actually kind of hard for me, because um, when I was a kid, I didn't really watch TV, to be honest. Oh, interesting, right? I, I mean, maybe I did, maybe I did when I was about, I think I started watching TV when I was like about 11, mm-hmm. maybe 10, so I guess I was still a kid, but I think, like... I don't know if I could answer with a, with a movie or something. I don't know if that's cheating. Yeah, well, I'll but... sh- well, if you want to go favorite movie of all time, I don't mind. Okay, well, maybe we can touch on that one, too. Uh, but I think as a kid, like, I remember I watched uh, the Ghibli films when I was maybe about seven or something at a friend's house. Mm-hmm. Uh, like Castle in the Sky and Princess Mononoke and Nausicaa and Spirited Away. And, like, I love those films. As well as, um, you know, uh, like... You know, The Lion King, like the old school. The old school. Or, sorry, not actually, I didn't watch The Lion King too much. Sorry, my bad. The old school Jungle Book. I loved, loved the old school Jungle Book. Yep. Um, same as, I don't know if you ever watched, it was a Disney film called The Black Cauldron. Oh, wait, I think, wait, I've, I think I've only seen that once. The Black mm. Cauldron, that rings a bell. That's the one with the, oh, when like the, the monster that kind of covers the city. The, he's like a, a devil, um, or like, oh, what is he? I'm pre- where am I thinking something different? I think it's I think. been a long time since I've seen it. Uh, I don't remember that, but I remember the whole thing almost looked like a like a, like an eighties metal album with the art style. At least right. like they had all these skeletons and stuff, and it was all very bright and colorful. And I loved it. I, I watched a video on it recently, and it was supposedly one of Disney's biggest flops. <laughs> ever. Yeah, no, that rings, that rings a bell. No, that, that I don't think it did well, but as a as a kid, I just. I just I was totally into it. I really love that one. I, that's always the best thing about doing these sections, though, is because like so much childhood comes out because there's so many different memories that we can all relate back. It's like, wait, he loves that. Oh my gosh, he likes that. She likes that. It's, <laughs> it's so cool when you do this part of the podcast. 
Robert, it has been legendary having you on the show. Thank you so much for it's coming been... on. Yeah, uh, man. Mm-hmm. It's uh, been a lot of fun. So if you guys have made it this far on the podcast, thank you so much for listening. It's been an absolute mm-hmm. pleasure. Yeah. Um, having uh, Robert share his whole story and uh, I'm pretty sure we could talk for another few hours um, <laughs> so thank you so much for coming on um, as always folks make sure to check My out pleasure. his work and uh, give him a follow and check out all his things you'll be seeing it on the uh, on the slideshow as always here on YouTube if you guys are new to the podcast as always don't forget to subscribe smash the like button as always and with that said folks we will see you in the next episode bye for now <laughs>